and the stream is uh oh hang on uh, 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 uh. just hang on a second um And there we go. Oh, we're not up for Twitter. Let me um, let me put Twitter in as well. Sorry about that. There we are. I'll just let the notifications go out for a minute or two, and then we'll get right into it. Cool. How long? When did you? When did you arrive in? Um, in Rwanda. In Rwanda um, about no, exactly two years ago today. Um, oh wow! So yeah, so yeah it's a two-year wow. anniversary. Um, yeah, so my wife works for the British High Commission. She's the development director here, so runs UK's response to development here in Rwanda. Um, and so, yeah, she's been doing that for two years. And then before that, we were in Khartoum in Sudan. Oh, um, wow. Well, you've got some stories to tell about. Uh, did you do Did you do much birding, bird, pho bird photography uh, in Sudan? Not a great deal. Um, was it? We got, we got a lot of black kites um, in Khartoum itself, but it yeah. was throughout the whole of the uh, revolution and the... I, that was what I was going to ask. Was it safe enough to, to go outside? Um, no, you took a camera outside, you're likely to get arrested. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, quite restricted. Yeah. Um, um, so here's a complete change. Um, it's yeah. it's a um, it's a shame, isn't it, that so much of the best birding territory in the world uh, now is places that you don't really want to uh, want to exactly. go to. No. Um, I mean, I spend... New New Guinea. I I, I want to go. Yeah. I'd love to spend. I'd love to spend like a year just plotting Those through yeah or, and but you know they're mangroves and um oh, amazing uh and the wallace line of course um yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly uh, but um, but they've just had the um uh the kidnappings and and whatnot yeah. in the last week a couple of weeks so uh yeah you've got to you you've you got to be careful. You've got to be careful, huh? Yeah. yeah. I spent, uh, what did I spend, just over a week in uh, Eastern DRC last October um, photographing growers, gorillas, and mountain gorillas with uh, some of the guys over there um, for basically one of the companies. Um, and that was that was touch and go um, at, at times. Um, mm. But the birding in, in Congo, again, it's, it's a biodiversity hotspot, much like Rwanda. It's just incredible. Absolutely incredible. Um, well, let let me let me do my um, uh, intro, and so yeah, and then this bit will get chopped out for the for the podcast. And if people come in and ask questions, I'll ask I'll, I'll ask them to do that at the you know at the end of like the formal interview. Okay. So that'll be the podcast, and then if people have got questions, we'll um we'll we'll deal with them uh, there. So. Cool. Hello everyone, it's Friday and that means we're back for the first of our live new Photography Fridays for 2023 and I'm really happy to introduce Will Wilson who, although he's got an accent that you might think is more likely to be chanting Liverpool, actually you're, you haven't got a Liverpudlian accent will you'd be more likely being the uh, Wimbledon athletic or something wouldn't you is that um, anyway will will's an Englishman who's been in Rwanda for the last two years uh, and has been taking amazing photos of birds and uh, I'm guessing other wildlife and that's because he's a wildlife photographer imagine that will welcome to the bird emergency on photography friday <laughs> tell me Thank tell me much. what Thanks for having me on. 
Tell me what's your Premier League club since I I started there. So, so to be perfectly brutal and honest, I'm not a football fan at all. Oh! I like my rugby, I like my oh, oh, I football. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. Don't tell me you're 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 a rugger lad. Um, so, um, yeah. Harlequins, <laughs> Harlequins, man is Harlequins, uh, Bath, um, and also wasps. So yeah, oh wasps. Okay, now wasps had an Australian coach, didn't they, in the last little while? That. Yeah, they've had a few to be think, fair, yeah. and the the, yeah. um, the Australian influence on UK rugby can only be a good thing, if I'm honest. Um, yeah, <laughs> to be fair, Australian uh, and so, South African influence, especially with current standings of uh, English rugby. Uh, so I'll just leave it there. I'm, I'm going embarrassed by talking about this. Now. <laughs> uh, sorry. Well, well, I was just going to taunt you by saying, well, we've got the best birds as well, but you're in Africa now, so I'm not quite sure that that I can. Uh, confidently claim to win. I mean, <laughs> ha, ha, you didn't send me a photo of a shoe bill, but have you come across a shoe bill? So shoe bills in Rwanda are very much on the eastern side. There are some, um, but they're hard to get to. The best place to actually go, and my Rwandan friends will actually probably kick me up for this, is actually Uganda at the moment. Um, so limited stocks in Rwanda, but they are there. It's probably the best way of putting it. Are, are they a bird that's? Sorry, well, are they a bird that's declining? In do you know? Yep, one hundred percent. So habitat loss um, has had a key input of that, and has pushed them basically um, over the border into Uganda. Uh, to be perfectly honest, are they as terrifying uh, in, in in person as they look on video? Um, I I file. I find it hard to um, be terrified of birds. I, I, I don't know. I just get my jaw drops and I'm just in awe of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not, um, it's just magnificent rather than terrifying. I put it as. I'm not, I, I'm not sure I'd like to be, you know, up close and personal with a, with a shoe bill in the same way that I don't mind if I'm up close and personal with an emu because emus are just really big chooks, right? Yeah. Um, but um, uh, I reckon a shoe bill has has got more Velociraptor in it than uh, uh, than than uh, Rhode Island Red. So yep, I'm pretty much going with that too. Yeah, I'll be I'll be with you on that one. Um, a stunning bird, to be fair. A stunning yeah. bird. So tell us briefly how you got to Rwanda, um, and like. Did did you go there with the with the intent of, you know, really making a, a, a living photographing birds and wildlife? No, I didn't. A uh, really good question, to be fair. I spent my formative years, the first 22 from age 18 in the British Army. Um, I met my wife in Afghanistan. Uh, so she works for the British government um, doing development um, in that sector. Uh, and I left at age 40 with a master's degree in security and set up my own consultancy business, to be fair, working and doing contract work um, abroad and at home. Um, and then my wife got the job in Khartoum in Sudan as a development director there, or de deputy development director. So we moved to Khartoum, Sudan in 2019 um, with a, an 18 month old daughter at the time. Um, and I was then doing consultancy work, working with some of the, uh, um, hotels and places like that to understand their security assessments and needs. Um, and then a revolution happened in Sudan, in Khartoum. Um, and that basically had us evacuated back to the UK. Um, my photography career has been about 15 years, but prior to coming to going to Rwanda, it was a lot, whole lot broader. So it was a lot more larger wildlife. It was uh, street photography, landscape, portraits, a lot broader. Um, and I was studying for a BA in photography at the time. And I was speaking to my professors going, look, all of my peers on this course are either wedding photographers, portrait photographers, they found a niche and they've gone for it. Uh, and I said, am I doing something wrong here? And he was like, no, you're doing everything right. You just keep doing what you're doing. And when you touch on what you enjoy, you'll find a passion and everything you touch will turn to gold. Um, we then fast forward to two years ago today when we arrived in um, Rwanda and Kigali um, and birds due to lockdown I had spent a lot of my time in at home 
um, and the birds that visited my garden. We have I, in my garden over 45 different species um, just come and visit my garden. Um, and so it kind of flicked my interest for birds. Um, and to be fair, I wanted to move past just photographing a bird perched on a branch. I wanted to try and capture the essence or the character of that bird. So for that, I needed to understand behavior. And so I started researching, reaching out to the online birding community because of COVID was great. Um, and in Rwanda here, there's a whole load of um, accessible guides, people, and a few really deep, deep experts within Rwandan birding. And to thankfully, they were very um, uh, patient with me as I got to know the birds, as I was photographing birds and going back to them and going, can you just help me understand this one? Um, and so a big shout out to the Rwandan guys in the Rwandan birding community to be fair for helping me with it. Um, so birds have only fluctuated since I've, or, or my passion's only been ignited since coming to Rwanda. Can I ask you about that? Because this is one of those things that we sometimes struggle with. I mean, I'm a, uh, I'm a white fella sitting in stolen um, Aboriginal land, right? And we're, and we're having that difficult conversation in this country, which is probably a hundred years too late, um, about ownership and relationships with with the land. I mean, um, you know, I was born here. I think I'm a fifth generation australian on both sides of my family tree now uh i can't go home to anywhere else because mm -hmm. there ain't any other home yep. so the the point of bringing that up is often when i'm looking for people to, to talk to will and i'm talking to people south america africa you know parts of asia and i'm wanting to speak to you know, local people with the the ethnic background, uh, cultural background from that location. But in the birding community, they're very difficult to find. Uh, from here, looking out, out as I do into the internet and into through academic papers or looking at people who are, you know, gigging photographers for one of, one of another, uh, yep. another term. Tell me... In East Africa, and even when you were in Sudan, is birding a thing that the local community, and uh, I mean, these definitions are difficult, but um, rather than sort of the expat or the, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll have to wear it up, the coloniser class, you know, um, is birding a thing in Rwanda? Um, maybe I'm, I'm guessing you're probably familiar a bit with, with Uganda and... and um, you know that that eastern northeastern part of of Africa. Oh, you mentioned to me before too, uh, uh, Democratic Re Republic of Congo. You've you've spent yep. time there too. Yeah. So I. You, you it, uh, 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 one. It's a great one, yeah. and nice to see where you're coming from. Are there? And I'll. I, I think I can speak with a bit more clarity on Rwanda, and Rwanda and birds are. They're, they're such a close link. And what I, what I find, what I found here in Rwanda is actually the spectrum of people that actually enjoy going out and bird, do um, and enjoy bird watching actually starts young and goes through to the old age. And that's um, linked into their culture, into Rwandan culture, into Rwandan tribal and ethnical lines as well, which is great. Um, and as well as that, so here in Rwanda, there's over 710 different species. Um, and of those, and it's not just the diversity of bird species here, but the density of each species. Um, and it's absolutely amazing. So I'm part of a number of clubs that go out birding and the majority, and I guess to link that in and give it a bit more context, um, here in Rwanda is roughly the size of the state of Maryland in the US. So it's small, but what it has in the north is volcanoes um, and really montane forests. Down to the west is the Albertine Rift and its dense tropical and montane forests. Um, down to the south, it's marshlands and westlands. Out to the east, it's savannas. And such a small country has got four different national parks, um, all of which have great birding. So the, guide, the guiding community, both for wildlife and birds in Rit Hole, is actually really quite large. Um, and so that link is already filtering in within those communities. 
Um, I will say, and I think it's, I, I am the same in the UK, those little brown birds that you'd know, you'd talk about, I would probably ignore them. And yet here in the tropics, uh, actually, they're brighter, they stand out more. But what I've heard from, especially on, online, um, is I didn't even know we had these birds here. So there is that uh, of the photographs I take and then share. So I think, and I take it as when I'm in the UK, it's normal, it's common, everything's going around you and you kind of become oblivious to what's actually there. Um, and so I think that's the case here and I think that's the case probably everywhere. You're more attuned when you go somewhere new, I think, um, and then settle in. So there is a big birding community here and it's only, it's only just increasing. Um, you mentioned that you were studying photography and that something hadn't clicked uh, for you at that, at that stage in terms of working out what, what kind of photography you were going to be, if I, yeah. if, if, if I got that right. Yeah. Were you interested in birds before you got interested in, in, in a you know, professional, intense way in photography? Not at all. Not at all. My, so my, as I say, my background in photography, I, uh, it's been about 15 years and about 15 years ago, I won my first safari and it kind of flicked my switch, what the guy in South Africa was doing and using his camera. And I was like, wow. And it flicked my switch. So I'm very much a photographer first and then a bird second. And as I say, my, my passion only ignited coming to Rwanda. Um, prior to that, it was a lot broader, uh, as I say, encompassing all sorts of stuff. And what I've really enjoyed, especially when it comes to birds, is how I was taught to shoot a rifle in the army. I track birds now for birds in flight. That's how I use my camera to shoot birds in flight. Um, how I was taught to locate the enemy, so shape, shadow, movement, silhouette. I now also now identify birds and wildlife in the, in the, in the bush. So what I would have consumed as um, or assumed as non-transferable skills they've actually become really quite awesome um, uh, and helped me a lot with my photography. So, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that uh, reminds me to one of those really tasteless jokes I, uh, that I learnt as a teenager, you know, join, join the army, uh, see the world, meet interesting people and kill them. Well, no, now you can learn how to... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's to a meet lot, interesting it's a people and learn how to photograph birds. <laughs> it's a lot better end state. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's, it's, to be fair, it's um, well, it's also really quite cool, especially coming to Rwanda and the birds here. Is uh, there's an old French photographer called Henri Cartier Bresson, and he said your first ten thousand photographs will be your worst. Will be rubbish. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And and I think I'm up to about eighty or ninety thousand now. But again, I put a caveat there. When Henri was talking about this, he was talking about film and before my age, not digital with a nice um, SD card that I can crack open 2000 with a release shutter that can, can go through them. So a bit different, but getting in the right direction, hopefully. Uh, before we went, we went live, I mentioned to you what my first experiences with photography were. Um, yep. Were you similar? Did you start off with a with a film camera and developing yeah, your own? So, yeah. On our first safari, we had a, a point and shoot, um, which actually I left behind in the, in the UK when we got to South Africa. So I was using an old the old iPhone with a pair of binoculars to try and get images. So you can imagine the results, not the best, but it kind of, as I say, that flicked my interest and my desire to learn more about it. So it was there, um, and when I went back, I got a a Canon 650D DSLR, which is uh, one of the, I think, 1.6 um, size um, formative sensors. So really quite small. And it was, it gave me something to share. And the, the good thing about a DSLR is obviously those interchangeable lenses, right? So you can go from macro, you can go to trying to go to a zoo and, and, and learn how to do wildlife photography and all of those kind of things. So it gave me a lot of freedom in that way. So. Whilst it's not the best camera, it was a level entry, and that's exactly where I needed to be at that space, I think. <laughs> so I, I want to take the step from that camera in a minute, but because I know there's going to be lots of birders uh, interested, I want to know, since you didn't have an interest in birds beforehand, what was mm -hmm. your sort of gateway bird? What was the bird that got you interested in watching and 
and looking and and sort of understanding what they do that draws you into then wanting to to take the photos so there's three birds i think i'd nail, nail it down to the one the first is the white browed robin chat which is a, a bird that is found in all gardens across kigali and probably from about 5 a.m in the morning it's the start of the dawn chorus he's the one that starts my dawn chorus every single morning um and every single day and then passes on to an african thrush but my point being is this guy is He's got lovely white brows, obviously, but he's got um, black on his head. He's got orangey rufous colors, and he's and he's a real noisy with a, a repertoire of song that you can just sit and listen to, and it's pretty cool. So from that angle, it was that guy that woke me up in the morning, the white brown robin chat, to, through to my first weaver nest that happened in our garden. And so watching a male, and it was a um, black-headed weaver, start weaving a nest over the water feature we got in our garden. And so watching him go away, get strands and just you can spend ages and hours watching how the intricate detail they weave their nest. So from that and then a, a bird we spoke about earlier that's on the front cover of the book, I hope we'll, we'll talk about later, but the Ross's Turaco. And so these guys are fruit eaters, a nice, big, prehistoric, primary color bird. But for the size of it, really quite agile up in the canopy of trees. Um, and until they fly, you don't just get to see their magenta wingtips which for me just blow my mind when I see them in flight. Um, so those are the three birds I think were my gateway birds. Um, and uh, yeah, they started up for me. Uh, before we get into your gear, um, and, I'll, and I'll come back to, to where, where I was, uh, have you got a group of birds that you're more interested in than than others like have you have you developed a a finch fetish or are you um are you chasing down every parrot of east africa or? <laughs> um i to be fair i think the key as I, I think with most birders i think there's, there's, you can split them into two there's the one with the checklist the one to get mm -hmm. every single bird uh and there's one that will quite happily sit there and watch for hours the behavior of that one species so I yeah. think I go so it, it, to more to the right. And then... So it's very much a spectrum. That's how I describe it. So yeah, I'm I, I'm at the I'm happy. Well, well, I'm not that happy if I have to sit and watch a, a domestic pigeon, a, a feral pigeon. But I will if that's all there is, and that's what I'll I'll do. I don't keep a formal list, so I'm I'm right down that end of the spectrum. Where are you? I'm, I'm with you there. I'm completely down that end of the spectrum. And I think, so I'm doing an online course with Cornell uh, University on bird biology mm. and physiology mm. to try and understand that bird behavior, right? So for me, I can quite happily go and watch any of the birds. And as I said here, in, especially in Kigali, there's over 280 different species in Kigali. Some of those are residents, some of those are migrants. So I can go out my door in 15 minutes, I'm down by a lake. And I'm watching kingfishers, I'm watching herons, egrets, I'm watching uh, bee eaters, I'm watching all sorts of stuff. So I guess I'm very, very lucky with where I am and what the, my aspect of birding and how easy it is to, to go and see those birds. But as far as favorite birds, uh, the kingfisher family, the bee eater family, um, and yes, the terracos are pretty awesome birds. And it seems that the more I learn about an individual bird as I write about them, the more I, one realize I don't know anything about birds. And number two, I fall probably deeper in love with that specific family of birds. So it's uh, it's like a parent who's got loads of kids. You don't love any of them more. You just seem to you get once you get to know them more. More of that comes in, right? Um, so yeah, that's that's probably where I put myself. But on the same spectrum as you, I think on the right hand side. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, I I haven't worked out which end it is yet, but I I, I just know that I don't. I don't do notes and checklists. I try, I do try and do the surveys in the regular spot, garden survey and, and in the park to add to that body of knowledge. But, yep. um, but I'm no longer interested in going, oh, yeah, I've seen that. Oh, yeah, I've seen that. Oh, yeah, I've seen that. No. Oh, yeah, I've seen that. I, and, I, I and I, I Sorry, I'm I'm a horticulturist as well, so I'm really interested in vegetation communities, and and I was actually wanting to ask you, um, yeah. what in Kigali, what are the streetscapes like? Like, what is is Kigali 
be, having been a colonised um, part of Africa and French history, uh, it does Kigali remind you of a European city when you were walking no. around it? No. So where the capital, the capital moved, and Kigali was built by Rwandans for Rwandans, and okay. Kigali is the cleanest city in the whole of Africa. Um, it is absolutely stunningly clean. Um, it puts any any other country I've ever been to uh, to shame with regards to how it looks after itself, as in the city and the cleanliness. On top of that, uh, the streets are lined with acacia trees. Um, you've got flowers down the central line or the main line of the main roads. Um, and so... So like like perennial beddings, bedding perennial bedding Correct. plants so so well that that kind of reminds me of well certainly of parts of melbourne where we've got that kind of thing and then you've got your your street trees fringing it acacias that's that's interesting um yeah. what what other so kind of acacias, plants old, really old acacias in the uh, sorry uh, are there uh, are there are there european stylings in the in the urban horticulture, or is it is it something completely different than in terms of not not just the plant material, but just in how things are designed? Is it, or or does Kigali look like no other city? Um, Kigali, so Kigali, first of all, is built on a number of different hills, um, and so surrounding those hills all the wetlands and grasslands so up in the actual urban areas on the on the higher ground um i don't think it's like any other city i think kigali is pretty unique uh, with how it is and what it looks like it's yeah i'm my book is called falling for the birds of uh falling for the birds of kigali hyphenated both falling for kigali and the birds here we go yeah Boom. <laughs> and if you can see here oh hello get my camera right if you can see there we here, are. Uh, yep. Hole falling yeah. for in Kigali. Um, so actually, I've fallen for both the birds here, but also the city and the place, the country itself. It's it's a pretty special place, um, and and that's one of the reasons. As far as the horticulture, yes, there's old trees and old acacia trees, and, and because of that and that old old vegetation, you get some of the barbets, um, and what you, in theory should only find um, in national parks, actually in in Kigali city itself. Um, and so the, the Rwandan government is doing actually a good piece as, with regards to try and save those trees and save actually that vegetation and keep the local indigenous vegetation there. Um, and probably a, a key thing to drop in here is, so as Kigali's developed in the wetlands, um, previously they probably weren't looked after well. And being a tropical climate, you get a lot of rain. When it's raining, a lot of rain comes down. And so the risk of flooding, um, especially when those wetlands haven't been looked after, um, increases massively. And so over the last couple of years, they've actually run a pilot project to re restore the wetland environment in one of the wetlands. Um, and to see, I was involved in actually understanding the baseline of birds once the restoration had been done and actually seeing the bird species coming back. Um, and so that link of Kigali and understanding, it's, yeah, the green and um, the environment place heavily within Kigali's strategy of understanding how they're actually going to develop, which is pretty special, I think. Um, from from your point of view, being there, you know, two years, um, is is the Kigali, you know, is is it a local council or is it a uh, like a, a province that runs the the city? Well, I don't really need to go into that, but 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 it, it, it are you confident having seen the way some places have been totally stuffed up in in other parts of the world? Um, you're confident that they've got the long term strategy, maintenance, and everything you know really under control yes. there. Yeah, yes, right. yes, I am. I think, yeah. um, and rwanda sits in quite contrast with a lot of its neighbors and its security stability and longevity of what's been going um and to see where kigali is now and where it's going and its aspirations is is very very impressive when you understand its history and where it's come in the last 28 years it's yeah 
it's very impressive. So, uh, I don't, I don't really uh, actually. Who published your book? Let's let, let's go with that. Let's get the let's yeah. get the ad let's get the ad out of the way. How yep. can people no get it? So my book was published by a Rwandan publishing house called Illume Editions. Um, it was printed in Belgium and then shipped back over. Um, so it's available in the shops here, but it's also available online at uh, commiesart.com. Um, and cool. you can and it's international orders from there as well. So it's it was my first foray into book writing, just as um, or, or to put a book together. Um, and I note in one of your questions is talking about um, basically when I go out, do I go for a specific species? And I think probably because of my layman um, and only two years into it within birding, actually, um, I don't go out and look for and to try and identify individual birds. It's more to try and get beautiful photographs of the birds that are there. Um, that will change as I go forward in, in my next job. But the book is 256 pages, 130 different species covered. Um, but also talks about conservation and restoration um, here in Kigali itself. Are you seeing a question that I'm not? Uh, 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 one not popped getting? up and it's now gone. Oh, uh, 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 this one. Oh, where 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 Martin was asking what what kind of habitat uh, is it there now? Yeah, uh, no problem. Ma so Martin, Chris. Uh, Sorry, we'll we'll mention that there are what four national parks, and yep, that correct. and that you, there's different habitat types for each one. So you you better do a rerun of that uh, of that bit about dividing so, up Rwanda. Yeah, no problem at all. The north of the country is uh, dominated by volcanoes, and uh, uh, um, and uh, with there's also tropical forests that move through. Uh, and so in the north, there's a lot of high altitude, and there's montane forests. Um, in the west of the country, the Albertine Rift is, is nice montane forest again. So it's nice thick jungly type forest that goes down the western side. In the south, you're looking at marshes, wetlands, um, and yeah, marshes and wetlands are basically what, what, what dominate down there. And then as you skirt, skirt east, it opens out into awesome savanna with a number of lakes. Um, and that's kind of that's kind of what sits in it. And it's Rwanda is known as the land of the thousand hills and when you actually drive around the place it's it's pretty stunning here it reminds me of a kaleidoscope as each corner you turn that kaleidoscope changes and the landscape changes be you into tea plantations um, up into the volcanoes down into forests or open into savannas it, yeah it's very it's picturesque it's stunning to be fair um, but yeah so those are different uh, and it's landlocked it's not coastal but there are a number of large lakes that allow you to have beaches. Land of course, is probably landlocked is probably a nice way to yeah. do it. Yeah. Uh, so, of course, we... Uh, um, no worries, Martin. Um, we invite you to uh, put a question, uh, make a comment, if if you like. Let's get into gear a little bit. Um, now, I, I, I left off mm. where I wanted to come back to. You told us about your first camera what did you what did you move to what did you graduate to so i went from the canon 650d to a second hand 1dx mark iii so huge for a full frame sensor of professional size increased shutter speeds um and allows me to shoot a lot uh with a lot higher iso and also i've I came or, or started with that camera to link on to using full auto, but using, uh, sorry, full manual, but then using auto ISO as well. And that for wildlife and bird photography is my go-to setting when I go out, because um, it allows me to react obviously with birds and wildlife. You've got a fleeting moment to necessarily catch that shot. And that kind of gives me a good a good start point. So it was a 1DX Mark uh, III. And then on top of that, I had a, an F4 400 millimeter lens. Uh, and I used teleconverters to increase my focal length as and when I could. So that was the kind of escalation from the 650. So what were you um, taking taking photos of at that stage of your uh, f photography journey? So, so to be fair, my 400mm F4 I bought just before coming to Rwanda. 
and so it's been predominantly birds um uh to be fair and also wildlife in the in the national parks so um i've been really lucky enough to work with and support gorilla doctors which are the vets that look after the mountain gorillas both here uh, in uganda and over in uh, eastern congo as well so um i've been using those lenses to also to shoot with that as well as a wide open i've got a 70 to 200 f2 uh, 2.8 as well which i use for a lot of wildlife so with 22 years in in the military and having that transferable skill of being able to track birds in flight, which is one of the most difficult things yep. that uh, most people who want to photograph birds uh, struggle with, at, uh, were, you, were you interested in, in photography that whole time? Because I'm guessing you got posted to many places in, in uh, 22 years. So if I say my initial start point within the military was in the infantry, I then moved across or specialized, let's call it that, in intelligence collection, some of that being working with camera gear. And so I had that kind of link. It was always a continuity. And to be brutally honest, when I left the military you know, after 22 years, it was a toss up between starting my own consultancy firm or being a professional photographer. And at that stage, I went down the consultancy line simply because photography was my passion. I didn't want to become I needed to rely on it for work and then that passion or, or would, would fizzle out somewhat. Yeah. So that's kind of where it came from. So you, you've you told me your your two cameras that you're using now are the Canon R3 and R5. Yeah. How, so, which one did you get first? <laughs> like, which one did you get first? And, like... Was it a, was it a hard decision for you what to, what to purchase? Yeah, I, I think I was a late. Um, I think I was quite late getting to the mirrorless game, to be honest. Um, and I, the technology both within the mirrorless lenses, as far as the auto tracking and the eye eye recognition of animals, to allow you to actually lock onto an eye, which is pretty impressive stuff. But on flip side of that, image stabilization that's not just in the lens, but also in camera body. in the body so you use mirrorless yeah. lenses with the body that double image stabilization is just absolutely mind-blowing so and i was seeing my i guess seeing seeing peers who are photographing birds going wow okay what well, how has that happened what well, i'm speaking to them i just try i came across the mirrorless um and it's so i was like okay so i saved up and uh, i got the r5 and i had to wait four months for the R5 to arrive and eight months for the R3 to arrive after that. And so I bought them at the Canon UK and then flew back, had my, had a Christmas, collected all my stuff and then came back with the family. And it was, yeah, that was my Christmas present, birthday present and everything for the first few years. Cause it came with, um, I, I also then got the 100 to 500 uh, mirrorless lens that goes with it. And that links onto my R3 and those two working together. Oh no! Oh no! We've got. I don't know whether that's my internet or your internet. Someone will tell us. Uh, before we started, folks, um, I made a joke about how bad our internet is, and we'll uh, point it out that it's not much better in uh, in Rwanda. So, hopefully, uh, it. I I hope that will will be back or i don't know whether i've whether i'm missing uh so someone in the in the in the audience right squad help help us out are you hearing me or are you not hearing me are you are you still hearing will um no will's uh, will's gone so i guess uh there we are transcontinental Okay, thanks, thanks, Naomi. Yeah, it, it must be Will's issue. Hopefully, he'll be able to come back in. Um, while we while we wait, I'm going to show you. Um, I don't know if you remembered. Ah, oh, here we go, Will. Uh, Sorry, there we mate. are. That's okay, <laughs> mate. That's, uh, we, I was I was just I was just telling uh, uh, telling the audience that um, we were discussing our internet 
issues in both countries. So uh, yep, 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 definitely. I'm, ge- I'm guessing that what that's what you had, maybe a power fluctuation or something like that. Um, um, to be honest, everything went blank and the blue circle of death started rotating in the center of my screen. So I was like, ah, okay. So I tried refreshing <laughs> and went back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's... It, it, it's good, actually. That's why I use this platform. It keeps the stream open for both of us, so that it's really easy to uh, uh, to come back no, in. Because yeah, there's there are so many uh, issues with internet around the world. So hopefully one day we'll all be uh, hopefully we'll all be over that. So oh, I know. No, I know he's back. Uh, so where, where where were we? Because I got sidetracked. Um, talking to the gang um, i was talking about um uh, transferring across to mirrorless going from dslr to mirrorless oh, that's and that, right that changeover. Um, that's right and and and, so and, 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 and having a christmas present for yourself which of course is how yeah, most photographers justify their spending don't they so completely completely yeah. um it's not an addiction it's fine <laughs> yeah, that's i'm right. dealing with it fine it's okay um it, hey, what was well, interesting about transferring across Oh, no, no, go, go on. I can bring this up anytime. No. <laughs> okay. So what was really interesting I found going across is with DSLR, I had a number of lens, lenses, so from prime lenses to also from the different telephoto lenses. And I probably had about six or seven lenses. So I sold all my DSLR stuff and bought new mirrorless. And I went from having maybe six or seven lenses for the camera down to I've now got three lenses that cover all my focal lengths. Um, and it's... I think it's a really interesting question is looking at wildlife photographers and bird photographers used to um, only go for big prime lenses because of the lift it would give you, but also the standard of those lenses and the glass you're getting. Mm. And I think with the, uh, the, the advent of mirrorless and how that's actually evolved, I think that question or that argument might come to be get revisited. So having a telephoto lens gives you so much, in my view, it gives you so much more flexibility. Granted, there's the issue with the aperture, but I think with technology that's come, uh, or the, how wide open you can have it in low light, uh, and therefore the speed of your shutter. Um, but I would argue that, and now with mirrorless stuff, actually that argument probably, or that conversation could be revisited. So as I say, my workhorse is a 100 to 500 um, zoom, um, and I've got then a 600 millimeter, which comes sometimes on a gimbal head on a, on a monopod. But if you're trepping around grassland marshes and the rest of it that's not exactly the most lightest or easiest thing to take with you and so i i would argue that actually the 100 to 500 allows me to do a whole lot more um do you do you ever just think oh so heavy i hate this bloody thing it's so heavy <laughs> um i do but i'm and I think because it's uh, the new lenses, so the mirrorless lenses are actually a whole lot lighter as well. So the mm. bodies are lighter, the lenses are lighter. So you pick up these lenses, the, the mirrorless stuff, and you're like, wow, okay. You then go for the old EF stuff or the DSLR lenses, and it's, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a heft. So, yeah, t- walking around with that and taking it around, it does take a toll. But the images you get still can't be the, – the reach, I think, you get um, and the clarity are great, but – I, I'd still go because of the, where I can do or what I can do with the 100 to 500 with the mirrorless. I'm, that's still my go-to. Um, do you? I think that. Like, um, sorry. Do you do you ever have discussions with other um, folk about the quality of glass and that the older lenses with adapters are better, so glass was better? Do you, I mean, do you, do you ever get sucked into any of those conversations? I try not to, but I'm probably getting up to this. I might be involved in some, um, so, <laughs> if I'm 100% honest. But I think, I think we need to, my, my personal view is you need to evolve with the technology. Gone are the days um, when you could only shoot with your ISO up to about 800, otherwise the noise would absolutely crucify the image that you actually had at the end of it. Gone are those days because of software that you can now run those images through. To be able to get usable images and all of that, is making use of the technology we have and being able to advance with it. Is the standard of glass better? Um, I'll hold my judgment until I see some of the mirrorless large prime lenses come out by Canon and make my own decision there. Um, the, yes, they're awesome stocking lenses. 
a lot of these conversations I, I tend to think are, are moot sometimes because unless you see the image on like on a really high quality um, paper in in a really well produced book. Um, most people are watching, uh, are looking at them on computer screens at you know seventy two DPI. So, so a yep. lot of the conversations yeah. about um, the sharpness and everything are really lost. But some people will talk about the honesty of the shot and that cleaning things up, you know, digitally when you've got noise when you have pushed your ISO um, past eight hundred. So I think. I think there's. Yeah, I, I think there's. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think. I think I, I'm a big. I'm still a believer. You can you can hear me but not see me. Okay, I'll continue. No, I'm, no, I'm no, still a big no. Believer we, uh, of uh, I like natural look. I'm no, go, go on, go on. You're 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 here. There's just a little lag. That's all. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I in keeping your images natural so i won't remove it, stuff from my images apart from digital noise i won't add different backgrounds i won't cut the subject out that don't get me wrong that's a type of photography or and you enjoy that that's great it's just not my style i i like a natural yeah. feel you know i won't remove noise because noise reduces the element of that photograph for me so i will reduce no, uh, take out noise um and Actually, I will I'll put stuff through sharpen if and when I need to. So, so I embrace technology, but I don't go overboard and start placing myself next to I don't know Toracos in, in the middle of my garden oh. that kind of thing. That's not yeah, my kind yeah. of idea. Yeah, no, I think that uh, that really goes beyond what what I was thinking about. I I can't stand those uh, those photos aesthetically where I see where people have put birds that just do not occur on the same continent. They put them together. And I think, why? <laughs> like, yeah. like, why? May, maybe to put on a set of plates or something like that that are being sold at, you know, Kmart or something? Sure, okay. But that's not, yeah. that's not, that's not wildlife photography. That's, that's no. trinkets. No, I agree. Yeah, yeah. But then again, there's a couple of people in uh, that I always see in Twitter who are doing it, and it's amazing that that um, that upside down U shape, that inverted U shape branch, that crops up in a lot of photos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's amazing. But they, but they, but those <laughs> photos don't say a thing to me. It doesn't matter what bird is in it. They instantly don't no. don't communicate to me in in any way. So let, let no. let's take no. that point. I think, what, I think what photos? So, oh, no, sorry. Go on. Yeah, I, I would. What I would say as a caveat is I so I also teach and do photography workshops here, and I think one of the key things I push is actually that photography as a whole is a process. It's not just you touching that button. It's your the planning of the shots and your gear beforehand. Yes, the element of actually taking that shot, but then there's also the processing and editing. And there is editing that needs to be done. Um, and, and and that whole workflow, I think is pretty key within. But as I say, you don't start turning your birds, inverting them and, and doing the rest of them or changing the color or all the rest of it. Uh, no, not for me anyway. It's not my idea. Oh, oh. Or if if you want to use a bird, you know maybe you've taken a fantastic shot of a hornbill, and you at and you're also doing, you know, side projects where someone wants you to do some album art. Album art, sure, go to town, but it, go. <laughs> but, yeah. but you know it's not yes. it, it 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 it's it, it's not the 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 frontispiece of your wildlife of Rwanda. Uh, book that's no, uh, not at all. No, uh, I'm, I'm well on. I'm completely on side with you here, everyone. <laughs> so the, 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 there's two things I want to talk about before we go back to back to your gear, like the intricacies mm -hmm. of your gear. Um, gear acqu acquisition syndrome. Are you a sufferer? 
<laughs> I'd love to say no, um, but I think I, I think I am right. But I think the um, gap and the air gap, literally both continental and uh, uh, yeah, continental between me and my the market I buy from actually has reduced my um, need or, or desires. So um, yes, I, I look at MV or on uh, YouTube videos and and what's coming through from Canon Next and all the rest of it, but. I think I'm actually quite happy with the setup I've got at the moment. And as I say, that's probably because I'm here in Rwanda and not back in the UK next to the shop. So, uh, yeah. Yes, I am. <laughs> so, 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 it, so if you had, at the end of your street, uh, the, the, the greatest camera shop in East Africa, you, you'd, you'd, be, you'd be updating annually. <laughs> Every time there's a new model, uh, you, you, you'd be on it. No, see, this is so with the lenses is probably where I am. I'm more with the glass and the actual camera bodies, and I say that at the moment with the R3 because it's even though it's not the flagship of Canon's mirrorless range, and that's still to come with the R1. Um, I, I I'll struggle to find a camera that's better than that. Now, I as as you've noted, my first camera was a Canon. I've always been Canon, so it's it's much like Apple and Android, right? You stick with one, and you've been with one, and you don't want to go across to another. And I think I've got some of that within it. And that's what's been interesting is doing workshops for clients who then bring a Nikon, bring a Pentax, bring this. And you're like, ah, it's the same, but the operating system that you've got to get used to. So I always have them uh, instruction manual come through to me first so I can actually understand <laughs> their camera system and the buttons at work. Mm. Um, so, yes, I would be knocking on that shop or at least going and having a look, window shopping at least. <laughs> Uh, are you are you somebody who watches a lot of other people on YouTube? Like, do you follow other wildlife photographers, bird photographers from around the world, and mm -hmm. and see what they're doing on YouTube? Or are you uh, are you a, yeah, uh, a yeah, are no, you no, a no, consumer no. of photography books? Um, photography. I was a consumer during my BA when I was studying for that, so I got two thirds of the way through, and it was all going towards studio work and, and, and album covers and stuff like that. And I'm like, that's no, 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 stop. So I, I actually stopped doing it. And during that whole process, and yes, I was, I was a consumer of photography books, understanding the history, and, and it was really quite um, insightful. As far as birds, and, and yeah, I'm a big reader when it comes to that, to understand birds, but also then in YouTube and see how other people do it. I'm a big believer in every day is a school day. If you're not learning, then you're not going forward. So yes i will watch other people and see how they're doing things um there's a uh, there's a channel called pangolin photo safaris based out in botswana those guys have some amazing videos and in fact there's a couple of australians who i watch as well and yeah i think they're brilliant and i, I think that's one of the good things about social media too is to see being on twitter and, and bird twitter uh, I think my timeline is vastly different to, let's say, my wife's, who's got politics and all sorts of development uh, stuff going yeah, on her timeline. Yeah. Mine is birds, it's global yeah. birds, which is awesome, which for me puts me in a happy place. But I see other photographers and how they, um, the results they get in, in some of the destinations, and it just, yeah, it's inspiring for one. Um, to be fair. Well, let, since you brought up destinations, let's jump ahead a little bit. Uh, yep. <laughs> What's what's the destination for photography that you most want to get to? Oh, really good question. I think Central and South America, if I could club them all together and do all of that at once, that would just, for, for a couple of years, that would be the place to go to. The neotropics for me have some amazing... Um, have amazing birds, amazing environments to actually go in, and challenging environments to actually go and photograph birds in. Um, so for me, that's one place. And obviously, as I say, I, Sandy, who we've spoken about earlier on, on Twitter, um, and a whole load of other um, Australians, and, and some of the, your, the photos of the birds there, that says to me, yes, I'd love to come back. Um, I'd love to go back to Australia um, and to do birding. So, um, yeah. So Australia and Central South America seem to be the place I want to go. And like continents are very big, so uh, I'm, I'm often uh, just 
chuckling, chuckling to myself when when people mention, yes, I'm, I, I've got I've got a three week trip planned to see the birds of Australia, and I'm thinking, Ooh, okay, <laughs> um, okay, <laughs> getting across um, Australia. <laughs> um, well. Um, well, it's like the the jokes you always hear from like the the Dutch tourists or whatever that that arrive in 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 Melbourne and and they ask they they're going to get a a bus to or or a train and they're going to Cairns. Um, w- will we be there by lunchtime? Uh, yeah, lunchtime on Monday week, perhaps if you're going by bus. You know? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's. I mean, look, South America, North America, Africa, you know, birding in China. I mean, they're just so big. So you've got to yeah. you've got to look at regions, or you've got to look at habitats, don't you? So, so let, let yes. let's ask: Have you got a favourite environment slash habitat that you really enjoy working in? So two, I'd put down. One is the marshy area. Um, one because there's there's so much of it very close to me, and I can I can spend a day quite happily tropping around in, up to my waist in water, and the, the sound, the song, and that habitat is just great. And as long as you're nice and quiet, then you get to see some amazing bird life. Uh, and the second one is savannas. The national park here in out to the east of the country, Akagera, is for birding. If yeah, it's, it's stunning from, and what makes it, I guess, what makes it unique is you've got all these mountains and ridge lines down to lakes, which bring obviously all the water birds, but then you've got open savannas. So the rollers and the larks, and it's just, yeah, the bustards, it's, it's just all there for you to go and see. So, and I like, what I like about savannah areas is it's the, the vastness of it. So you can actually stop and look and, and it's just all around you. And that's pretty cool. And that's contrasted to the wetlands and the marshes where everything's nice and close and up personal. Um, so in Rwanda, those two, um, I say that the, the vast majority, so 26 of the endemic species found in the Albertine Rift are all in the, in the west of the country in a, in a national park called Nyungwe, um, which is all Albertine, for, uh, the Albertine Rift. And so it's all uh, montane forest, which is absolutely stunning stuff. So... You probably wanted one, and I've given you three. So apologies about that, Grant. <laughs> no, that that that's fine. You can you, look. You can tell us anything you like. <laughs> um, we're going to jump into some of the photos you you sent uh, sent for me to talk about. Um, but let's yeah. just see. Naomi Naomi's got a comment here. Um, so Naomi met some chaps from Rio. They went birding with Naomi. Now Naomi is in the Sydney area, um, Will, so okay. you can place her. I'm down in the Melbourne area, so you know we're only about 900 k's apart. Um, so a lot of people are stunned by that. And Melbourne and Sydney are quite close by in in relative terms in Australia. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they went birding with Naomi and asked how long it would take to get to Broome. Yeah. Okay, now now you know where Broome is, don't you? From uh, so right on the other side of the of the continent, um, Naomi. If you weren't flying, I reckon for me to get to Broome from Melbourne, if I wasn't flying, and I don't have a vehicle, so I go by buses or trains or hitchhiking or whatever. I don't reckon I'd get to Broome within 10 days from my place. Wow. Um, I could do it faster, but I, I don't want to sit for three days do, and do nothing else other than... Well, actually, I don't think I could do it in three days to get from Melbourne to Broome. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, here we go. They were in a combi. Of course, you, it, did you know, do you know that song, um, Down Under? Yeah. Um, Will, was that a men at work? Was that a hit in the UK or anywhere that you were oh, soldiering? Yeah. Uh, Travelling in a fried out combi? Um, yeah, anyway. combi A combi van. I couldn't imagine anything worse. Travelling in, in an old combi, no air con, dodgy suspension, 
the windows don't work properly. You'd be driving through the hot air. You'd be, oh, it'd be okay. Um, well, yeah, Martin, Martin's got the got the right point. Yeah, imagine. Well, that that's the thing, Martin. Uh, I reckon. Well, I know that when I travel from Melbourne to Broome, which I'm not sure which way I'll go, um, and because it'll probably be with an e-bike. It's only either, either going to be an e-bike or it's going to be actually on foot. Uh, we'd, we'd be talking months because I would be stopping everywhere, taking photos and recording stuff and interviewing people and <laughs> probably, probably, I'm sure. probably taking. Yeah, I mean, you've got to enjoy the journey. You've got to enjoy the journey. So let, let let's go to a photo. Since we're talking photography Friday, we were talking about. Oh, another comment in. Here we go. Um, Go via the Nullarbor, yes. Uh, Will, you said you you mentioned you've been to Australia. Have you have you been to the Nullarbor plane? I haven't. No, I came in two thousand and six as part of an exchange with the military. So I was UK military, and I came to Holsworthy to work with your oh, okay. RAR guys. Okay. Um, Did and then I spent? I was meant to have four and a half months traveling the country and see it, and I actually spent four and a half months over in East Timor. Now, oh, wow, that's pretty amazing. But you weren't into birds at that time, were you? I wasn't, no. Uh, and it wasn't really oh. the, um, let's put it, it wasn't really the environment to go uh, burning at that stage. Uh, but yeah. but I think when you're in, in in a place like Timor, if you're into birds, it wouldn't matter. You don't have to go birding. They're around. It's like, it's like when I go to the Philippines and Malaysia or Indonesia are the same. Nobody there is taking any notice, and I'm going, Whoa, oh, what? Whoa, oh, oh. And everyone else is just going, hmm, like down about their day. Uh, I'll, nev- I'll never forget seeing a flock of Java sparrows um, in, 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 a, uh, in a rice paddy, and, and I, I just stopped, and I'm going, oh, wow, whoa. And Nobody else. Hundreds of people went past me. Nobody, nobody was remotely interested. Some people did stop and wonder what I was looking at. You know, I was just going, "Wow, Jarvis Barrows." Yeah, uh, no big deal, no big deal. <laughs> All right, you mentioned water. You mentioned water marshes. Um, I want to start. I want to start with this one. Tell us. Tell us about this bird. And actually, anyone who was uh, in the Difficult to Identify Birds uh, podcast that we did on Monday, this is not a fig bird, right? So you might recognise the pose. No, no, it's not. So, so what this a- is a Hadida ibis. Um, Hadida ibis. So related or in the same family as the African sacred ibis and your white ibis you guys get white ibis which I love the the terminology yeah um so yeah so this is a hadida ibis noisy um great call uh and actually the hadida comes from the call it makes in flight uh and a friend of mine uh who's a guide actually said um Swahili over in uh, Swahili, Swahili folklore says actually the reason they're called they call when they uh, are in in flight is actually because they're scared of flying and they actually go ha, da, da, as a, as a, it's a real screechy scroll um and it's because they're scared of flying which i think is a brilliant little folklore um so yeah these guys are found here in the city in kigali but across uh rwanda noisy in the morning so they're cooperative as in they woke up and they're quite social animals so when they, these little birds wake up i say little they're quite big but when they wake up they'll call to each other and that's at about 5 36 o'clock in the morning so if you've got some roosting in a tree you're going to hear them so they're no- noisy and gregarious with that um but yeah how did arrive this uh do they in uh, take on any of the habits that we uh that we have with our bin chickens here are they uh, are they adaptable to <laughs> so no, to the no. urban fringes? Um, they are they are on the urban fringes, but uh, and to be fair, I haven't seen them around any of the bins, the skips, any of the refuse areas. So I wouldn't say they are, and I, I wouldn't say they are. Now that doesn't mean that they haven't been, but I personally haven't seen them do that. 
Um, so that, that lovely long bill, bill they've got is for obviously going deep into, um, getting deep down into the, into the soil, into the, the soft soil around the marshes and the wetlands to get up food and grubs. So that's what I've seen them doing rather than, uh, rather than anything else, but yeah. Do they hang out in uh, flocks or small groups or are they more solitary? Groups, definitely groups. You see them individually, but normally in groups. And that's when they're in those groups, you hear them gregariously talking um, or, or communicating between each other with their, with their calls and their contact calls. Um, loud, uh, gregarious. But yeah, so groups, definitely. But the odd one here or there, but normally in groups. And as I say, they'll roost in a, in a community group up in a tree or, or in the surrounding trees. And then when they wake up, they're then talking to find out where they are to work out if it's time to go and find food and the rest of it. And they get even noisier come breeding season, or at least the males do, as they then try and uh, attract the females. So they're a colony nester, like like our white ibis um, in chicken? Yep. Uh, to be fair, I haven't actually seen any of their large nests, um, and, and so probably couldn't say, but I, I can't see why they're not. Um, so the sacred ibis, which is very similar to your one, um, does, and that's in the wetlands and, and on the ground. Um, so I, I would assume that the hadid ibis does as well. Yeah, I, I haven't. Sure, so want I haven't checked on the uh, on the status of all the ibis species uh, recently, but um, mm -hmm. there, uh, there's a northern bald ibis, a southern bald ibis. We've got the Australian white ibis. Is the sacred ibis in Rwanda one of the bald ibis, or is it a different species? Do you know? Um, I don't know. I'm presuming it because of the naming, it's a, a different species, but it is bald, that black head that mm -hmm. goes from the beak all the way down to the bottom of the neck. And so they are bald. Um, uh, and so I, by, I'm guessing different species, number one. So the African sacred ibis here gained its name from back in ancient uh, Egyptian times. The Egypt, so yeah. it was... Sorry, go on. Oh, yeah, I'm just agreeing. Yeah, just the... Uh... Egyptian um, idolatry, yeah. Yeah, and, and therefore linked to either get rid of all the plagues and insects. So it was one of the gods that they prayed to to look after the crops, uh, basically. Um, but yeah, so very closely linked. Normally seen in, I have seen them in mixed groups with these guys, the Hadadar Ibis and the African Sacred Ibis, and on one occasion with the Glossy Ibis as well. And do they um, also hang out with spoonbills? Uh, it, it's the right idea and the right shape of what I, uh, territory and, and environment that they should be. So yes, um, yeah, okay. normally I see the spoonbills hanging out with the sacred ibis over in Nakagera National Park around the lakes and east of the country. Um, so yeah, I can't see why these guys wouldn't be. All right, let's um, uh, let's stick with water. Um, mm. I'll go with this one because it's quite similar in a way to that one uh someone's uh, building a nest yeah. yeah so the, these guys are called the hammercock um and as a bird they're they're a shorebird they'll eat they'll take frogs and the rest of it but what what stands these guys out is their nest and, and that's kind of one of the reasons i put that i wanted to share this one so these hammercocks build the largest nest of any two birds in the world or at least in africa i think the world any two birds and so their pair bond, when they start building, it can be up to um, six foot high and six foot wide, big, big dome shape on in the fork of a tree, a large tree. And so their pair bond, when they do then come, come together, is actually maintained and strengthened when they start building it. And they'll take up to about 12 weeks to build this nest. Um, and even once they've finished and they've actually laid the, they've laid the eggs, they'll continue to put more twigs, bits on there. And if it's in an urban environment, then it, let's say it's in a garden, for example, kids' toys have also been picked up and put yeah. in this decoration. Afterwards. So th these birds for me are just absolutely stunning. They're incubation chainers. So inside it is a tiered system. So there's three different levels inside the nests, which I think is just awesome. Um, and again, these guys, their calls are pretty cool. And 
because as I said, Kigali is built um, on hills and around in the wetlands and the marshes around them. So you get them, they're able to go down to these marshes and feed and then actually build in the safe locations in the gardens. Um, and once they're used, other birds use them as well as snakes and owls and weaver birds and all sorts of stuff will come and build their nests with them. Um, and so these guys will then move on and build another one. I've seen this one, uh, one hammercock nest right on the side of the main road in Kigali itself. So that's, it's pretty awesome. Now, I can't, I can't tell, and I deliberately didn't look, look up any of the birds today. Mm-hmm. Now, is it, do you know, is it a, in the heron egret family or is it in the stork family or is it totally on its own? It's on its own. It's very on its own, and I I, I want to look it up now, and I can't, uh, so I won't. I think it's very, the nearest one is to actually a pelican, and that's the nearest okay. one to, and it's it's very much on its own. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it does look reminiscent of a of a pelican. It, it, what I thought might be stalkish about it, building that massive nest platform, but then with different yeah. chambers, that's yeah. a little bit like. You know the behaviour of like our mallyfowl and uh, and uh, brush turkeys and yep. and weavers, and if it's collecting child's toys, it's a bowerbird as well. <laughs> Pretty amazing, <laughs> amazing creature. Yeah, they're, they're absolutely awesome little birds, and it's you can obviously so the hammer hammer cop is cop meaning head, so you can see the shape of the back of the, yeah. the head where it gets its name from. Um, really, as a, again, just like the ibis, actually, it has quite a, a squeaky, squawky kind of call, which isn't melodic at all, but uh, unique and uh, easy to recognise is probably the nicest way of putting it. How big is this bird? What what could you compare it to? Medium sized wader, but with small legs, not like a. Um, it's, it's a shore bird rather than a wading bird, so the legs are quite small. Um, what would I like size wise? Uh, is it like a lapwing kind of size? Um, um, um. Interesting. Uh, the bigger, big, bigger than a lapwing, a lot bigger. So than, chunkier. It's not not necessarily so, taller or bigger, but chunkier. So um, big, bigger than a a black shag, great shag. Uh, Different shape, kind obviously. Of, I, I wouldn't go the same sort of size. Body. Yeah, yeah. I'd say body size, maybe like a, maybe either a little eager or a cattle eager. That kind of that okay. kind of shape and size. Cat, cattle eager um, size. Okay. Yep. yep. Okay. Yeah, but I with think, smaller I, legs. I think, I think most of us probably know uh, know the cattle eager. I would, I would say. Now that shot uh, is that all? Was that all automatic settings? Mm-hmm. Um, can you remember what you took it on? Uh, no, it's all manual. So, well, as far as when I oh, say okay. all manual, I'm using a manual aperture, manual shutter speed, and then auto ISO. Say again, Grant. Can you can you remember what what uh, what settings roughly? You, I, I, I know I didn't I, I didn't ask you to to tell me that, but can ah, you, you can you remember uh, what can you remember about this shot? Uh, so this shot will have been used uh, the 70 to 200, um, so that's an f.2.8, so it would have been about uh, f4, 5.6 um, is where it would have gone for, and shutter speed is a minimum, one two thousandth of a second for a bird in flight, and that's quite, um, as I say, medium-sized bird, so that that hit quite well, and it was quite close. Mm. So this was actually in a friend's garden in the middle of Kigali at about 7 o'clock in the morning. Um, oh, and wow. so ISO would have been pumped quite high, uh, maybe at about oof, maybe at about sixteen hundred to two thousand ISO, because okay. it's coming out of the shadows into the light. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, very, very, very good. Um, okay, let's go with that one, the Pied Kingfisher. Where was this? So this uh, was taken at um, a golf course or photographed at a golf course uh, with a whole load of water features. 
What I love about this guy, so this is a male. If you look at the throat, you can see a black band on his throat. And just below, there's a lighter, small black band. So that's meaning two black bands across the throat or, or the chest. And that tells you that it's the male. The female only has the single darker one that's not normally joined in the middle at the top. So this is a male and it's diving for his dinner. Um, the good thing about these guys is, number one, they're the largest bird in the world to hover using wind power alone. So not using wind assisted or, or thermals or anything like that. And so actually what that does is allows a normal kingfisher will use the sides of the bank, um, the grass, the reeds to perch on or a branch. So, and so it has the edges of the river as a hunting area as such. Whereas these guys, because they can do that hover, they're all, they, they extend their area that they can actually hunt in. So they've got the whole of the water feature. So that's what makes them quite cool. Um, coupled with, I love the fact that they're pied in black and white because it just shows that you don't have to have brightly colored awesome birds to make them look stunning. These guys are exactly that. The patterning and, and the coloration is just awesome. Um, but this shot was done for... Um, part of a group of shops I took for uh, a commission um, for someone who wanted actually the kingfisher coming back out. So I had to track them going down and then from the hover, take it going into the water and then and then actually coming back out. So that's what this guy is. Uh, do you have many species of kingfisher in Kigali? Uh, in Kigali, we've got five different ones. So we've got this guy is the Pied Kingfisher. We've then got the Malachite Kingfisher, which is a lot smaller, um, maybe about 11 centimeters in length totally. Um, dropping down to the African Pygmy Kingfisher, which looks very similar to the Malachite Kingfisher, but it's got like a lilac wash on its, on its cheeks. Um, then going the other way, uh, you've got the Woodland Kingfisher. So it's a non-aquatic uh, Kingfisher, loves the woods, obviously. And you watch it, watching it hunt the woodland kingfisher, which is pretty awesome. They love to have overhanging branches into the long grass. So just as you'd see an aquatic kingfisher diving into the water, these guys dive into the long grass like that. Um, so the woodland kingfisher is quite cool. And then the last one is the giant kingfisher, which is the largest in Africa uh, of the kingfishers. And that's that speckled black and white speckle you see on the back of the king, uh, the pied is similar but the other way around, it's dominated by the black, but with white speckles. Um, a stunning, with a stunning rufous uh, bib on his chest and neck. Um, but yeah, so those and, are fine. And, and, and is that a, a aquatic kingfisher? Like, uh, is that... Um, yep. 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 Okay. So, so the, the giant kingfisher, the malachite, and the pied kingfisher are the three aquatic. And then the yep. African pygmy and the woodland are non-aquatic. So I think the African pygmy is is quite similar to our um, in in terms of the niche that it's in is like our sacred and forest kingfisher and and the woodland is is Africa's kookaburra really uh, same kind Sounds of like it. Um, yeah same kind um, one of, of thing. The guys, yeah, one of the guys who is uh, a guy called Rob who I follow on Twitter an Australian and his. Some of his king, your, his kookaburra stuff that he's got in his yard and, and the kingfishes you guys have are just, wow. Yeah, they're stunning. Absolutely stunning. Yeah, we do have, uh, we do have very cool kingfishes. Um, the tropical ones, you know, I, I haven't really seen any of the far north Queensland ones, but they're amazing, amazing birds. Uh, especially with the big yellow or big red bills. I love... I love those um, Asian, the Asian ones especially. Yeah. Oh, right. Sorry. Some of the, the dwarf, the Asian dwarf, the oriental one, the dwarf ones uh, are just stunning. Beautiful little creatures, such brightly colored and, um, I don't know, tiny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, like our, our little kingfisher is tiny and then, the azure kingfisher is pretty small as well uh, and yeah um i i saw one in uh in malaysia i've got no idea what it was because i didn't get a good enough look at it but it was it was a, a, just a pocket rocket as well uh fast really fast but just a fleeting glimpse yeah. 
Okay, let's uh, let's have a look at the uh, Jakarta. Uh, which one would you like? Let's go for the let's go for this one first. I like oh, I really like yeah. this pick. Um, this one only was, one. Um, only one Jakarta? Only one Jakarta in uh, in the area? There's African and there's lesser as well. So there's two. Um, what, I, what I love about these, uh, these birds is, um, number one, those toes, I think, are just awesome, the yeah. long toes. Yeah. And that obviously, so they're also known as the Jesus bird because obviously they walk along the lily pads and as if they're almost walking on water. So they're sometimes called the, uh, the Jesus bird. Um, and so and, and the li lily trotter as well. So if other people yeah, might know I them like as it. lily trotter, yeah. Okay, so these guys um, are down in the local wetland, maybe about twenty five minutes, um, twenty five minutes from the house. A, a wetland called Masaka Wetland, which has got the lily pads, which they prefer. Um, and these guys are using the, well, as you can see here, using the toes as a drag as he's coming down. What's out of shot to the right of the screen is a lily pad that he's coming in to land on or she's coming to land on, to be fair. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to do here. But you'll notice it's actually really quite white and there's no horizon line. And that's largely because of the perspective I took the shot from, but also white due to the fact that really, really overcast day. And so when I increase the exposure, I get rid of the gray and it goes white. And actually it brings a lot more of the detail, I think, into the bird itself. Yeah, especially uh, getting the, the yellow tones uh and the, the the buff tones on on the bird um so dragging its toes is mechanical brakes <laughs> yep yep Usually you can see the flaring wings and then they drag their toes as they're coming yeah, in just yeah. before they land yeah that what to... these guys are quite um different with regards to their their breeding behavior or their breeding patterns than a lot of the birds so this with this one the the male will choose a female, the female lays the eggs, and then it's the male that will incubate and raise and look after the, the chicks. And when you see, um, I think you can see it, there's a number of them online, I'm yet to photograph them, this uh, behavior. So when they have about two or three chicks and they want to then move, the male will calls and the chicks come underneath either side of them. And there's like kind of uh, uh, under the wings, you can hold them. He can hold them, and so all you see is those little feet hanging out under his wings. Hanging out the bottom. Around. Yeah, really quite stunning birds. Yeah, they. Um, yeah, the African yeah, chicana is, is a cracker. And of course, we've got another, another one. Uh, yeah. Just the composition of that is just great, isn't it? it yeah. Yeah. I, it's. Again, early mornings, flat water, and you can you can get some really nice shots. Um, but this is the grey that I'm talking about, so I haven't increased a lot of the exposure with the background there, and I've kept it the same. I think actually it works a lot better um, with this one, at least anyway, to, to get those tones out. But yeah, I think it's you're right. It's the um, perspective and the composition. It's, uh, yeah. it's a, they're, they're cracking birds. <laughs> Uh, have you got this one on your wall at home? Um, I do, yeah, I have. Oh, yeah, uh, in, my, that, in my wife's office, actually. <laughs> yeah, that would be that would be one out of all of those that I I, I would have picked to to display at home. Um, so you're getting a, a a comment there from Martin. Very very good. Um, now what what did we go to about? Have we got more water ones? Let me just let me just check. Um, no, well, I, I teased I teased this with a few people. So we're moving sort of away from water. We're going to water's edge or or um, uh, yep. found in found on in, in the savanna as well, isn't it? This one, uh, well, yes, it is. The, it's, it's found on the savanna, the wetlands, and it's. Uh, the national bird of Uganda. Um, this this one here was taken out at a crane sanctuary um, just outside of Kigali, um, and so it's, it's a really quite it's a grey crown crane. Um, what what's really interesting about this guy, especially with regards to Rwanda, not necessarily the photo itself, but the context of in the last five years, um, the population numbers saw a massive decrease about uh, at about five six years ago. Um, and a conservation project was put in place by a good friend of mine 
who um, set up a sanctuary to take all all of the cranes that were kept as pets previously, and so therefore had um, flight feathers removed and all sorts of stuff to keep them there as pets, and basically were maltreated due to a lack of knowledge to understand or understanding of how to look after these birds. So the project opened up, and they had a, a, a private sanctuary as such where they brought all these birds to rehabilitate them. Those that were able to be rehabilitated and actually were um, healthy were then released into, into the parks and into the wetlands around Rwanda. And those that weren't were kept at this nature reserve um, and, and allowed to have a better life, really. Um, and that's then blossomed into, uh, so numbers went at the low point, went below 250 left in the country. And for the first time last year, so they do a national census of these birds and the first time since then, it's now back over 100. So a really good increase in numbers. And what's great for the population at the sanctuary is that now the wild birds are coming back and the breeding with the birds at that sanctuary. So you're seeing birds returning, which is actually quite cool. And so seeing chicks. But yeah, the great crown crane. And, and is, there, is there managed slash captive breeding going on at the sanctuary? Like, is, is, um, is not, there... So there's no there's no program uh, to actively replenish the the population with intervention. And I know okay. it's been done wild and on their own on the bird's own terms as such. No managed um, yeah. uh, integration of it. But so so that's as the bird itself, grey crown cranes. They're just stunning birds to look at. I think they they obviously their crown and the crest, but the colours as well on the face, uh, the the hood at the black hood at the front. Um, and then the wispy grey. So this was, as far as the photography goes, this was used um, using a technique called panning. So I had a, a shutter speed of 1 80th of a second to actually get the flow of the movement of the wings there. Um, so it was breaking it down the normal. What, that looks like. So where, where your infantry skills came, uh, came to the fore. So. Exactly that. It's, um, so if you take that, so in the infantry, you're taught two different methods of uh, shooting a moving target. One's called the ambush method. You know where it's coming, so you wait and it flies into that or it comes into that area and then you engage or you track and follow. So that's kind of what with, with larger birds, that's a whole lot easier to do, um, tracking and following. And this guy is obviously a nice big bird. You mentioned that the population sort of crashed and there's probably a number of reasons uh, for that but that they were being kept as pets is that because they were the national bird and they were so popular that people wanted them was there some some sort of status uh with so keeping them like, like a peacock so yeah exactly like a peacock it was a national bird of uganda not rwanda but yeah. The elites across Central and Eastern Africa, within, the, within their large gardens and the large popular hotels, would have those birds in there as pets. So much like a peacock, but then not understanding how the birds were or should be looked after or transported, and therefore injuries and, and the removal of feathers and broken wings and, and the like to, to keep them there. So, so that's where it was, and it was quite a common thing back in the 80s, 90s, and early noughties. So... That's the transformation that's happened here in Rwanda. That still kept as pets in other countries, yes, but here in Rwanda, no, um, which is pretty impressive. Now, when I grew up, well, did I grow up? I don't know. When, when I was young, um, we just had the crowned crane. Uh, are there Are there a couple of species or has it just been... They've just done a renaming. What what can you tell me about the grey crown crane as against the the crown crane? So the grey crown crane is the only one we find here that of a crane that looks similar to this one. Um, and again, only through looking at photographers, one in Ethiopia, do we then get to see. I got to see the other crane. So that is the only crane that looks similar to this. Now, yes, there are other cranes here, but not within the crowned element or within that family. Um, so here in, here in Rwanda, at least. Now, uh, Martin's talking about photography again, uh, technicals. What can you what can you remember about ISO and shutter speed on this one? So as I say, ISO with this, 
Um, what, what's the intriguing suspect with when you go from uh, normal birds in flight down to panning is you reduce that shutter speed down, therefore you've got to get the light. Normally, uh, as you reduce the um, aperture is wide open, so you've got way too much light, so you've got to reduce that aperture as well to allow for the light and you to get that speed. And so ISO, I have mine on auto um, a lot of the time and the majority of the time, unless I've got a static bird. So birds in flight would be auto. Um, I can look, let me have a look at my phone and I'll be able to tell you what I have my ISO. Two seconds. Um, and I can, I can give you that kind of information, no problem. Ah, of course. So you're, you're looking up the, the metadata on the, uh, Correct, on on the, the shot. Image. I can find them. Well, I, I think panning, uh, again, panning is one of those, uh, those techniques that, I don't know, it's like a lot of bird in, bird in flight. They take a whole lot of use to, uh, getting used to, and there's a whole lot of misses rather than hits. So for this, the ISO was at 100. It was at 500 millimeters, um, f7.1, and 180th of a second. So those were the metadata as such of what I was using. And about how far away from the bird were you? Um, I'm just trying to think. So it's on the platform, so maybe 20 meters, 15, 20 meters. Okay. Okay, quite close, yeah. Yeah, so, and, and that's one of the great things about this sanctuary for birds, especially getting these guys in flight, is that obviously this guy here, you can see that he doesn't have a band on his leg, so it's a wild crane, mm. rather than the ones that are looked after at the sanctuary, which are all bandits, so you can obviously know who's who. Um, and so this is a wild crane coming in, and because they've got that population that can't leave, wild birds do come in. So it allows you to get those, these sort of a shot. Um, uh -huh. There we are, Martin. <laughs> I think I think you need to repeat that. No problem. No problem. No problem. Uh, ISO one hundred. Aperture f seven point one. Shutter speed one eightieth of a second. Um, and and which which lens would, would did you have uh, part? Was, this was on the R three or the R five. R three. So it's a one hundred to five hundred out five hundred millimeters. Okay. Um, and as a rule of thumb, the larger the bird, the slower you can take that shutter down. So I reckon even on this at 180th of a second, I could have probably knocked it down to 150th of a second, probably get even blurred the wings, maybe some more. But that, I think that's not very quite, well, not very, I think that's subjective and that's down to you as a photographer to decide what you want. Um, mm. It's also, I think panning shots, unless you can go somewhere that you know that flight, so you're standing in one position and you know the bird's going to come from either left or right or right to left or what angle, um, you need to reprogram. So I have on my, uh, like an, it's, a, it's a command function just on the right of my lens on my body that I can press. So my normal settings are one two thousandth of a second um, aperture on the, that one, so F7.1, and it's at 500 millimeters. So, and my ISO is on auto. If I want to do panning, I've set a command function that I can then click it and it will take my shutter speed right the way down to 180th of a second, but then it can increase my aperture up to, um, I think it's at F12, I have it at, and therefore it gives me an ability to start panning straight away. So if that shot comes up, it's a great one to go. Um, and so as far as panning, I like to go for panning when the, when the light gets low and or the, the low light is there, therefore you can't actually have the, the shutter speed you're after. Therefore, panning becomes a great option and it allows you to do more bird in flight shots, even in the low light that you can't get the shutter speed that you want for a crisp, clear image. Well, before we get to the shots of birds that have nothing to do with water, um, I, I'm... With with the cameras you use, with the bodies you you use, do you have them? Uh, I, I presume you've got a couple of different set settings that you can you can have, like menu one. Oh, you know what are we saying? Setting lot one, two, or three. Do you have yep. do you have one lot set up for at home, and then do you have another pl p patch that you go birding regularly, where you have another lot of settings? maybe that you know you you normally go there in the morning or in the evening um 
or do you do you go go through and rework, tweak your your settings in each so of I your really, menus? I will go with. Um, good question. So, at the, if it's the beginning, I normally start, and my cameras are always set at one two thousandth of a second aperture with a one hundred to five hundred at seven point one because that's the widest you can go. Um, and then if it's the f4 and the 600 will be down at f4 so it's nice and wide and open um and i then will then change it as i go as i said i've got a button a command function that i can press it will take me to the panning settings apart from that i'll tweak as i go um so i'll have that as my control setting is there but then before i then get from the car put your gators on and get everything to go i'll check my settings on the light and then i'm good to go um and it's I don't know. It remind for me. It's the back going of going on patrol. You go check, check, check. Yep, everything's yeah. ready. Let's go. Yeah. And so it, it takes me back to that. <laughs> Do um, you like going you know, out? That that kind of whole click is. Do you like going out with with someone else, um, or do you prefer you and the camera, and everyone else can get stuffed? <laughs> if it's going out to new places, um, I'll go with guides and or friends, and I'm more that's great. Um, if it's to repeatedly go back to the same place, I'm going. I'll go. I like to go on my own, and I think uh, photography for me is very cathartic. It's very therapeutic. It allows me to cut everything off around and focus on that one, on on the things that are in front of me, so the birds and my camera. Um, and that's been, to be fair, for my mental health, it's been, a, the nature and birds have been an amazing piece for me. Um, and that's coupled with the fact at the moment, I'm, my wife is in the UK. Uh, she's going through breast cancer and chemotherapy at the moment. And so I'm at... ...in homeschooling and, and looking after her. So, oh, hello. Yeah, we... You, you dropped out there, so uh, so we got that your wife. Oh no, <laughs> oh no! Uh, it's not very often we we get someone whose internet is worse than ours, hey, in Australia. Um, think up some some questions for for Will. Here we go. Will's back, <laughs> or he's nearly back. We've got the here he is. He's back now. Um, <laughs> so we. we um, but before before we got the uh, the 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 hang up there, uh, sorry to hear your wife is is back in in the UK with uh, undergoing cancer treatment. You'd be pretty happy about the NHS, wouldn't you? Um, that you you've got the option to uh, uh, to avail yourself of that. It'd be be pretty rugged if you had to go back to West Virginia or something, wouldn't it? Um, that's what I always say to people when they go, oh, we've got these socialist governments in uh, in Europe and Australia and New Zealand and, yeah, but we can go to hospitals. So, anyway, only good thing about it. About it. Um, how's she doing, Will? Um, we have to ask. Oh, no. <laughs> no, here he, he's back. <laughs> Did you get any of that, Will? I'm losing you. Can you hear me, Grant, still? I, I can hear you. Um, I can hear you. I hope you can hear me. I, I just asked, how, how's your wife doing? And uh, is she going to be away for an extended time? I mean... Oh, no, I'm not... Um, um, oh, hang on. We've got the blue screen, the black screen. Uh Here we are. <laughs> I think you're back this time, Will. Right. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Right. Yep. 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 No, we we, 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 we did get the we, we did okay. get the whirly gig. So um, I was just asking, um, how's your wife doing? Like, is it, is she going to be away for quite some time? To be fair, she's doing uh, four months. Is her chemo? Um, she's had the mastectomy already. Then that went really well. Uh, as, as well as the mastectomy can go, but it hadn't mm. spread was the key bit. The analysis of the nodes afterwards meant it hadn't spread. So the chemo is literally to make sure 
uh, belt and braces that it doesn't come back hopefully so that's for four months um so and then she'll be back out here between the mastectomy and, and chemo she's out here for a few weeks anyway so it's, it's in a good place and it's going in the right direction is probably the best way of putting it oh that's uh that's great i i'm always interested i uh, i had to undergo undergo the knife uh uh as well and um uh, it's the best thing waking up it's pretty good uh martin martin obviously came in late will is currently in rwanda in in kigali um uh yeah. martin you yeah. probably missed our little conversation about what kind of a city is kigali and 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 i had to ask some horticulture questions as well uh we can we can jump into i'm hoping that this is in your garden will um tell me if it's not this is my assumption uh uh, We've got actually. Um, this is uh, so you've got a scarlet-chested sunbird female feeding a class cuckoo chick, um, so breed parasite. Which I, I've been reading around the subject of breed parasit and, uh, parasite parasites, and I, it just I find it intriguing. I think my initial um, my initial feelings were like, oh my gosh, it's so bad. How can the cuckoo do that? But actually, it's nature, and and when the more you read about it and understand as a breeding strategy, I think it's uh, really interesting and really intriguing. To be fair, I did an episode uh, on cowbirds in the brown-headed cowbird in North America, and uh, you know we often hear people not not loving cuckoos because they eject the mm. eggs or other nestlings but the brown-headed cowbird doesn't do that so it's a it, it, it's a friendly brood parasite so um okay. yeah so. I, I for me i think it's um i was reading a book about a study that was done on the common cuckoo back in the uk and it's actually the intricate detail that a female cuckoo needs to do and understand um of its surroundings so it won't just um use one host uh, it will use one it will prefer one preferred species but actually there'll be seven or eight different nests that it's trying to get its leg, eggs into um and it needs to time those eggs for once an eggs already in in the host nest before it puts its own egg in the time it takes um and the whole process behind it is really just fascinating now martin's made a comment here a very aussie looking photo um yeah because You've got an acacia there, or perhaps an albizia. I'm, Very I'm not sure, but I think, yeah, because <laughs> because we've got an acacia or an albizia. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty think it's an acacia. Then you've got a curved beak honey eater slash sunbird, and then that cuckoo could be any one of the bronze yeah. cuckoos, or or um, yeah, it just looks. Uh, it does look quite Aussie, but so much about Africa and Australia are, are quite similar because we've got the dominant plant species, or well, the dominant plant families in in Africa are quite similar to yeah. what we have here. And structurally, a lot of the habitats are very uh, are very similar. And of course, uh, some birds, cookers, uh, we've got them everywhere. Well, we've yep. got birds that birds that look like them and do the same yeah, thing as them uh, everywhere so so th 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 this was your garden um yeah so it was the front garden and it was i was drawn by the obviously the calling of the, the young cookie waiting to be fed calling 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 um and uh, it was i think that there's that similar sound of all young birds or chicks calling and so it kind of drew me in but and, uh, and obviously you see the, the larger uh, cuckoo just sat there not moving quite happy but really quite um stringent with it i want food i want food i want food that big call um and then to see the uh, the sunbird then come in and, and feed it was yeah pretty impressive the, the size of that bill going all the way into the cuckoo's mouth was uh, was quite cool uh, I'll just take this opportunity to say to those watching on Twitter, 
if you want to ask questions or uh, make a comment, you can't do that by any means other than sending me or tagging me and letting, hoping I catch it in the notifications. Or you can come across to Facebook or YouTube or Twitch and you can be involved uh, as as Martin is is uh, so Martin you, I'm, I'm trying to remember I, I can't remember where everyone is Martin's in uh, no you'll have to you'll have to remember me Martin tell me where you are it's not not Melbourne I know that so fairy wrens you know the fairy wrens will uh, like a little superb blue wren. I do, which, only from uh, yeah, from yeah, photos. Really stunning yeah. birds, really, um, uh, really, yeah, fascinating birds. Uh, learning about them actually doing my uh, course with um, uh, Cornell University. Really interesting. Um, really quite complex social behaviours. Absolutely, and um, I'm hoping we're going to be diving into fairy wrens again soon i did see some new research uh pass me by in the twitter feed today um and of course joe from the fairy wren project it's about time we got joe back and will uh, every second monday roughly uh dr holly parsons from birdlife australia mm -hmm. urban birds program manager joins me and she did her phd on the superb fairy wren so we're always talking fairy wrens here um, and Martin is in central Queensland on the coast. Awesome. Uh, so south of um, Rockhampton and Cairns. Um, what, about a third of the way between Brisbane and and Cairns, I would say. Maybe a little bit more than a third of the way up. So uh, always happy memories of Gladstone Will. The first time I saw a Pacific Baza. In um, or as it was called then, the oh, crested wow. hawk. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah. The evolution of so Yeah, I won't bore everyone with that story. They've probably heard it a million times. One of my one of my favourite bird watching stories. That region of Queensland have given me two great bird watching stories. The other one was the grey falcon, uh, which I saw totally by accident. Um, okay, what? Was there anything you can remember about setting this shot up, or was did you did you go did you hear the bird hear the cuckoo and then go and grab the camera, or were you you know did it just present while exactly you had your that. camera in your hand? Just no, present. exactly that. I heard it, went and saw, and then go in and grab camera. Um, but due to the nice proximity or the close proximity, I was able to get because obviously both concerned about what was going on rather than me there with my camera. Got well, actually quite close, to be fair, um, without distracting or getting involved with, or getting involved with the behaviour. So, and it, they, they actually sat there, so I haven't, it, it, it composed itself nicely with the sunbird being higher, the cuckoo being lower, and I think it, that's what makes it sit nice for me. So that was with the composition, um, to be fair. Now, the, the Australian sunbird species that we have here and... The Southeast Asian ones that 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 I'm familiar with uh, make a hanging nest and will often nest, you know, under under a veranda, you know, by your back door or your porch or something. Uh, is is your sunbird uh, very happy to coexist with you? <laughs> so. This scarlet chested exactly the same. It has a dome-shaped nest that will hang from uh, the edge of tree or the branches. Looking quite, um, compared to a weaver's nest, it's quite uh, disheveled is probably a nice way of putting it. Um, and, and can actually look the way it hangs, like it's debris just hanging off the edge of the, of, of the, of the branch. Um, so, again, not surprised that the cuckoo's not in the nest, but on the side of the branch because of that fact. Are they... Will will they nest really close to to the house, or uh, are they quite happy to be in really close um, proximity to you? Not necessarily. Well, 
Yeah, I've had variable sunbirds, which are a little bit smaller than this guy. These, these scarlet chested, or this, this scarlet chested female, they're actually quite, um, of, of the sunbirds, quite of a shy, the shyest, shyer ones. So there's uh, two or three other species that will, uh, we've got nests uh, up and around the balcony or on the side on the, there's a big palm tree that grows and they, they're in the underneath. Um, uh, they're still on the underneath of the sunbird. So uh, the nests are actually hanging on the underneath of the palms, which is quite quite cool. Now, the, the, um, oh, hello. yeah, Na Naomi's a, um, a question from Naomi. Yeah, and and I was going to get to get to this because this is one of the the issues we're always talking about um, in Photography Friday when we're talking about taking photos of birds, um, luring, calling, squeaking. Um, what what are your thoughts, Will, to get that shot? So, number one is I don't use, I don't use lure or bait to do anything like that at all, um, and I don't use calls or feedback calls to to get birds to come, um, largely because I don't think I've got the experience to understand the calls and the impact that'll have on the birds, um, and I don't want to stress the birds out or put them in a situation i've seen and heard anecdotally of stories of photographers doing that and it's not from the photographer i've heard that story from but actually from an ornithologist who's looked at the bird and gone that bird's in distress it's agitated and you're there taking photos of it and i, I just don't agree with that so no i don't use that um however i have been out with um bird guides in one of the national parks who's used them because he's been working there 20 odd years and understands the birds um so I don't, and and that's the reason why. Yeah, it's one of those issues that that comes up all the time. I think, uh, and that and even sense, yeah, and even in research, uh, you know, calling calling doesn't need to be intrusive, but too many people, as you made the point, will who don't understand what the calls uh, are for. And the reaction that it will prompt from a bird that uh, is necessarily going to react to a territorial call or a threat call or something, um, it's probably always best to not do it if you don't know if you don't know what you're doing. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd, exactly. I'd, I'd, exactly. I'd, I don't do it. And I, I've heard terrible stories too. I haven't actually seen anyone bombarding birds with playback but uh, for, for photography but i have seen bird watchers doing it and i get i get furious about it um but yeah anyway yeah. i don't i don't own the birds neither do they all right uh oh another another comment uh uh yeah i'm I think I think Martin's agreeing with you. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure that's agreeing with you. Um, yeah. Yeah. So let's let's have a look. How th this species of cuckoo will, uh, when they're fully grown, yes. how do they compare to the common cuckoo uh, that, that that we're familiar with from Europe? so these guys will go um you can start to see the green coming through but they are dominated by the green lovely beautiful bright greens um size wise quite similar maybe a little bit smaller than the common cuckoo um but still has those stripes you can see the bands across the chest that go down and there's also on the tail but for these guys it's just it's like it's, it's just a green gem that's out on a, on a on a perch when you see them they're stunning absolutely stunning um and so they back here in rwanda they will also not just use as you can see the sunbird there but a bird called the black-headed gonolek which is like a bush shrike um and i was uh i was in a down by a wetland and seeing a watching a class cuckoo perch there early in the morning and then out of all of a sudden a pair of these black-headed gonoleks which are um black and red red chest and, and bottom of the throat come flying out of the side of a tree to my right um, and clashing into this cuckoo to harass it to get it away. Obviously, the, the gonoleks must have had a nest nearby, but just to see that harassment behavior was pretty impressive to see. 
Um, but yeah, so class and class cuckoo, just think emerald green, bright emeralds, and you, you've got this shiny, lovely, beautiful cuckoo. It if that's is it going to grow much bigger than than the size of the fledgling? Uh, it does it slightly, yes. Um, and I think that banding kind of calms down, so it's more ripe, but it's more so. And the vivid colours of the white and the green make it look a little bit bigger, I think. And this is probably not our best angle because it is leaning forward with its head up. Yeah. Um, with it. Yeah. I think I think it's going to be very similar to our bronze cookers here in uh, in Australia, where we've got the uh, iridescent uh, metallic green and white underbelly. Uh, yes. For the adults, and and they it seems to be a similar size. Um, yeah, I'm just writing down bronze cookie because I want to go away yeah. and have a look at them. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, shining shining bronze cuckoo. Have a look, just look for okay. that one. Um, some good shots and some good uh, vocalizations on eBird. Um, ah, cool for sure. Um, okay, let, let let let's let's have a look at. This one, this is a great bird. <laughs> it is, yeah. This is the double toothed barbet, and you can see that by its top mandible, the two um, like links in it, um, or, or, or teeth looking edging. Uh, so yeah, the double toothed barbet. This is an adult, um, and this is taken in one of the suburbs of uh, Kigali, uh, and is these guys are ca nest cavity breeders so they'll nest in ca the tree cavities and this is that they like the old acacia trees so either ones that have used by woodpeckers or barbets previously or they'll excavate out um cooperative breeders so they'll all come together and you'll see it largely in in family groups so it's last the years before the previous season siblings coming through to help out um and yeah they're just a stunning bird to watch um and they they present gifts to the the, the male will present gifts to the female and they'll have quite a long-term pair bond, so you'll see them uh, going back to that same nest box and reusing that, or not, not box, but cavity, but going back to use the same one. So if you find one in one of these old acacia trees, you can obviously guess that they, they go back to that same one again and again, which is pretty lovely to see. Um, cooperative breeders. Mm. So uh, will you find more than one pair nesting in in close proximity or is it just that there's one pair um nesting and, and and then getting previous generations or the uncles and aunties who haven't found a hollow helping out the latter exactly the latter yeah. so rather than colonial as in not a colony of it it's that single family group but with helpers that kind of that ethos of um helping so indirect fitness i guess um have you that. noticed have you noticed that they like the hornbills uh, in that they will actually ex excavate their own uh, hollow? Yes, yep, they'll ex excavate their own hollow and they go in cavity. But unlike the hornbills, they won't um, cover them up. It'll still be that circular yep. woodpecker-esque hole that you expect to see, I guess. It's probably the nice way of putting it. But yeah, they do. Um, and that's, you can see the rictal feathers around uh the, the, back, the base of the bill and that's largely because they're in that dark and excavating it and I've got a, another photo of one of these guys coming out but with wood chippings all over the bird and it just <laughs> looks like it's been in a sawmill or something it's, it's a lovely photo um, but yeah um, but the there was a there was a shot um, on Twitter I don't know if you saw it I think I saw it yesterday um, and I think it was an African hornbill and uh, had just started attacking a tree to to start excavating a, a hollow. I'd never seen anything like it. Um, I I thought they would start on uh, uh, where where there had already been some sort of cavity starting to form. No, nope, this this bird was just like like a woodpecker. I I hadn't seen anything like it before. Um, Beautiful shot, whoever uh, whoever um, did it. So what have, what have we got? Martin's got good eye contact. Yeah, he's checking you out, isn't it? For sure. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And yeah, 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 yeah. It is yeah, yeah. it. Um, is it a special bird? And quite one of the larger barbers too. 
um, give us. Uh, is it? Is this in? So we'll get, uh, was this in a private garden or in a, a, a in the street or in a park? Yeah, it was in. Yeah, it's one of one of the expats got in touch and said, "I've got a um, a friend of mine said this expat's got." basically an old acacia tree that the um, Barbert family's been there. And apparently they've been there for about three years in this tree, returning each season. And what's quite cool is unlike, I think unlike what I'm used to back in the UK with those strict breeding seasons at start and spring and going to late summer, these guys, I think because of the, I guess the, the lack of temporal change and they're quite st stable environment, when there's an increase or there's great food, these guys will breed. So there's no set time frame that you expect to see them. Um, so it's more triggered rather than by uh, the arrival of spring or the longer daytimes. It's the abundance of food that make these guys go for it, as as in start breeding. Yeah, that they're a really interesting, interesting bird. Oh, Will's <laughs> Will's gone again. Uh, hopefully he'll be back shortly. Um, they they look they look to me very much like um, like they might behave like uh, carawongs or or ravens. I'll I'll ask Will. Here we are. <laughs> hello, <We're>, uh, <laughs> hello, hello, Will. Um, we we really are finding uh, finding that colonial internet is not that flash, is it? <laughs> Back again. Uh, well, what can you tell us about when no. when the when the barbet is not um, uh, not breeding? Is there a a European slash British bird that you can think of that it is like 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 the the niche or the uh, the habits that it displays? Does it remind you of you know, is it shrikish? To be honest, no. Um, I can't, to be fair. They're quite... Um, um, There's another another question too. Uh, we're having we're, we're not having good luck with uh, with Will at the moment. Um, hopefully he'll he'll pop back in a minute. Uh, yeah, the 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 lighting is is nice in this, isn't it? Um, I also like the 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 diagonal composition. You know, one, two, three, sort of uh, diagonal lines. Um, yeah, there's no doubt that the the beak does look like a a saw and a punch. Uh, yeah, that the the tooth is. It's pretty amazing. We'll we'll ask we'll ask Will. Uh, I'll just take him out and then so pop him back if he can come in in a minute. Um, I don't think we're. I've got, I've got you. I've got you back now, Will. <laughs> we really are. We really are in the Hello. in. Hi, we're we're really in the wars, aren't we, with the uh, with the internet? But we'll soldier on. We've only got one more one more shot to get to get through. Um, question okay. from question from Naomi, though. Will, um, what do they eat? Yep. The the barbet. So fruit, fruit, insects, and date palms. They, this this family here had a massive uh, palm tree with loads of date palms, and this is what they were courting on. One at the time so largely fruit but also seeds um fruit seeds and insects so quite an omnivore as far as a generalist when it comes to to food but preferring the these ones preferring the date palms are there many barbets uh in in the area is there only or is there only sort of one one barbet in in your region in kigali and you know other ones in in different places, or do you have maybe three occupying different uh, niches? So, so uh, Gigandi, we see um, 
two two barbets. There's the uh, double tooth one you've seen there, and then there's also a smaller little one called the spot flank barbet, which is a lot smaller, sort of uh, like a finch size, that kind of thing. But again, nesting in cavities and trees. So those are the two main ones that I see. And then when you push further out into the national parks, you're looking at um, the crested barbet, uh, the red-faced barbet, the bare-faced barbet. There's a whole load of different. And then the, the linkage into tinkerbirds as well. But Kigali, only the two. I say only, but yeah, the two. Yeah. T tinkerbirds, that's a great, uh, that's a great name. Um, named why, do you know? Um, I think when you, why actually, no, my guess, no. this is just a guess from me, if you look at the barbet compared to the tinkerbird, they're a smaller, daintier kind of version of a, of a barbet. So rather than that, that thick bill for burrowing, it's a lot smaller, but they've still got the flex and the, the flanks and the colours, the coloration of a small spot plant barbet. But I don't know, yeah, more of a daintier tinker more of a small bird i'm guessing is, is where i'm going with it um but yeah that's why that's my guess now i'm i'm only going to ask you this question because you're british what's a tinker <laughs> um so rather than being british i'd, I'd push you to tinkerbell and uh, captain hook's friend so that's a uh, it's a type of someone that, that tinkers it, it goes around and collects stuff and and puts up and builds stuff together so that's where i got tinker um yeah step step toe and son um kind of uh that, <laughs> exactly. that was the show yeah, wasn't exactly. it yeah so, um so yeah very correct very good. yeah oh wait wait when you dropped out before too, um, uh, there was Martin's comment about the um, about the barbet too uh, for the dappled light. Let's um, let's bring it up again because it feels like a million years ago that we had this up. There we go. Uh, now I, uh, that? I missed that. Please yeah. let me know. Uh, dappled light <sighs> is is good. And so can you can you see what we've got up there now? Uh, oh, you should be able to now. Yeah, dappled light is Thank good. You. Uh, in the lower, I, lower oh, of the there we go. Sorry, I pulled the wrong, uh, yep. uh, the wrong, uh, the wrong one out. Uh, yeah, I made the comment. Uh, what I like about this shot, um, apart from the fact that it's a cool bird, is you've got the the three diagonals in the uh, going across, like the the shadow at the top, and then this yep. uh, branch above the bird's head, and then the bird the the perch that the bird is sitting on all give that sort of, um, you know, one third, two thirds uh, kind of break up. So I knew this would start a discussion. Taylor, no, a, t a tinker was like the, 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 <laughs> the, 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 the junk man with the cart going around collecting your scrap, uh, the things you don't want, and then selling them off and repairing yeah. little broken things. And the tailor, of course, uh, yep. repairing and and repairing clothes. Uh, yeah, Naomi's made the point that the the barbet does look a little bit like a whistler. I'm thinking a bit more like the shrike thrushes as well, but uh, they are prominent. It's uh, I hope it's coming up nicely on on people's screens. Uh, the 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 whiskers. I like that. Um, is that is it a yeah. solid yeah. solid black uh, uniformly on the back that bird will? So it's it is black, but it's got that like more. It's it's nearly an iridescent blue that comes through. It's a shame lines. you can see on yeah. the top there. Yeah. You yeah. can see it's like a bluey black. Yeah, it's a lovely sheen on it. Um, it's a stunning bird, really beautiful. But yeah, those um, those ricks or bristles. So, so the whistle uh, the whiskers there because obviously it spends a lot of time inside a nest cavity and so it uses them for touch as it moves around with inside that cavity and can see what's going on um so but yeah they are, they're, yeah they're quite cool yeah because yeah. um get, going back uh, half a million years they were always going oops bump me head oops bump me head oops <laughs> until i got those feathers <laughs> 
exactly. Yeah. Evolution's yeah. awesome. Hey, yeah. Hey, bird god, can you do something about this? Bump me head again. So, yeah. Uh, okay, <laughs> let's get to your... <laughs> let, let's get to your last shot that, that you give me. I saved the... I don't know if it's the best till last, but boy, this is a stunning bird. Yeah, the, these are pretty impressively lovely, beautiful birds. Um, so quite big, uh, quite large, but still really agile within the trees. And these guys are fruit eaters. So the tree you can see behind um, is a podocarpus tree with it that fruits um, in my neighbor's garden. And we've got some in our garden. So from the balcony of my house, I can see both trees that it likes to fly from. Um, and as I say, it's quite agile for the size of the bird. It's quite agile moving around within the canopy. Um, and so they, what they do is they'll, they'll come in quite low. So they'll come in quite low to the tree, have a look for the fruits. Then they clamber up to the top of the tree before then gliding as this one is down to the next tree. Um, and so the, what I love about these birds is the wingtips, the majestic into red wingtips that only you only get to see when they're in flight with their wings out like this or with a wing when they're in flight um they're all covered away once they're perched um but it's also the prehistoric look of them I, they're just amazing birds my, my daughter calls them the primary color birds the primary colored birds um yeah i suppose yeah uh <laughs> so do, 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 do they appear more navy blue than black when you when you're seeing them with the naked eye yes yeah. yes uh, there's there's that kind of sheen that iridescence like like similar to the um color on the barber you saw on the back of the barber but th this is more bluey more bluey than black definitely um but now, it all I, depends on that light um, now i can see the uh i've i've got a notification for the co for a comment here and i'm guessing i know what it's going to be Oh, no, it's not. I'll put it up anyway. Uh, Naomi said it's a stunner. Um, yeah, suburban, uh, suburban. I think we can see a roof in the uh, in the background. Podocarpus, we have podocarpus here in, in Australia as well. Um, but it, I was expecting so someone to say... Guys, um... Sorry, sorry, Will. Uh, this delay is killing us. But uh, I, I, I was expecting someone to put in the questions, so I didn't get it right. You didn't actually tell us what the bird's name was. So I was waiting for sorry. someone to go. It's called the Ross's yeah. Ross's Toraco. It is a Toraco. Um, Ross's or Ross's. Yeah. 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 Ross's. Yeah. So Lady Ross's Toraco is his full name. Um, yeah. Musafaga Rossi is a scientific name. Um, and that, so what's the, these guys are fruit eaters, as we spoke about the podocarpus tree, um, but also love avocado, love figs, anything that you'll find growing in the, in the mangoes, anything you find growing within the trees in the garden, these guys will love to come in. And they'll come in in groups of up to about six to eight at once. Um, really gregarious in their song uh, call. So if you go on eBird and, and listen to their call, it's really uh, unique, um, and it's yeah, it's a stunning call. Really quite awesome birds to watch. Um, but yeah, in my garden. So this was on the balcony, um, and because of all the the fruit trees around Kigali, there, there's actually quite a good population here. Um, quite stunning to see uh, in an urban environment. To be fair, not your normal bird. How big are they? So, um, da, 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 what are we going to say here? Um, I'm trying to think. Think of a young peahen, that kind of size. Okay, so and so they're hornbill size. Yes. Yeah. No. Completely. One hundred percent so. Okay. One hundred percent so. Because they because they look very much like a hornbill, I, I, and now that I know that they're a big bird, uh, I I was wondering if they would eat a mango or an avocado pretty much whole, and would they then be distributing those big seeds around, or are they yeah, uh, or are they ripping the fruit apart? 
Um, so the, all the, the podocarpus, at least, and that's probably the main one I've watched to me, is everything is going down whole. Um, and they, they're very bit smaller. So it's the, they'll swallow them whole and then, um, yeah, dis distribute as they go as such. Absolutely amazing, amazing bird. Um, so I'm, lo I'm looking away because I, I, every time I see a notification on Twitter, you can see people have been... Uh, have been watching on Twitter, but we haven't got any questions. So I just keep checking. So that's why I'm looking away. I'm not looking away because I don't want to talk to you. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So I wish, I wish they'd, I wish, I wish Elon had fixed Twitter and allow it to talk to um, all the other programs uh, like, uh, like Facebook and YouTube and Twitch do, because it, it doesn't matter where people are from. Uh, they can join in. Right. So that's um, that's finished up with the the photos we wanted to talk about. I I want to ask you just a few more general uh, photography and birding kind of questions. Um, and someone someone's got a comment, so. Uh, Uh, I I don't know I don't know if Martin's making an Afrikaans joke there or something on I, I I don't know run run they, they would run here Twitter um I don't I, I don't I'm know sure. we, 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 whenever I see Martin you'll have to clarify whenever I see H E E R I just think of someone doing an Afrikaans joke so um. Okay. But uh, <laughs> so, but we've got a tenuous link, Africa. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know. I probably I'm probably verbaling you there, Martin. Just um, uh, sort us out. Neither of us got that one. Um, well, what's are you? You, you mentioned that you you're always looking at YouTube and checking out what other people are doing in their photography so what's hmm. your um what's your next uh, goal you've got the you've got the book out yep. and you're doing the you're doing the the writing and you're obviously sharing yep. the i mean I'm, well actually let me ask you about that about your writing are you mostly writing for beginners are you are you looking to get people into nature? Um, That's exactly it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, in general, like I, I know just when I look at my stats for the podcast and and on YouTube and where people are from. I mean, Europe, North America, Australia, big, big, big birding places. Uh, How's how's East Africa? And look, you've 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 been in uh, uh, Khartoum as well. Um, I'm I'm always surprised when I go into Southeast Asia how few people, how few of the locals are are interested in in what's around them, and a lot of that I think is because of the economic situation that. You have to be well off enough to have the time uh, and, and and the resources to enjoy stuff around you, rather than just get getting a meal, right? Or 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 fit or fixing your roof from the latest typhoon, um, you know, or or the yep. latest flood or the latest earthquake. So, uh, um, and th before we before we get on, um... Martin. Uh, I was verbally Martin. <laughs> I think there's plenty um, of um, overlap. Yep. So yep. I think there's plenty of overlap there. I think um, your your points you raise about go on. It's, that, that's just the delay that's that's got us going. I'm relax. I'm reacting, and there's obviously those minutes in. Uh, do Do you speak to school groups or anything like that? Will? 
So I think um, there's overlap with your thoughts with regards to uh, time available for people to do that. Um, and number one, my writing. Uh, my writing is definitely for the layman because I put myself in that bracket as well. Um, and it's that's where that's where I feel I've got a, an area to write about, whereas it's not for um, the, the advanced birder who knows all sorts about the birds. It's actually to increase people's awareness about what there is here in Rwanda. Um, so the book itself was number one to highlight and promote, I guess, showcase some of the birds that I've photographed in Kigali but also to promote, I think, Rwanda as, and Kigali as a bird watching destination. Rwanda, I think for tourism wise, is known for mountain gorillas, which are stunning um, and also and I've been working with within that field. But to try and go, actually, Rwanda's, yes, it has some amazing wildlife, but the bird life is pretty awesome as well. And it's literally on my doorstep. Um, and that, that's kind of what it was there for. Um, and so the book, so as far as, uh, is there the local, what, what's the local thoughts about bird watching in here in Rwanda? There's, there's a lot of birders that go out and bird both. And, and this is what I was trying to say earlier, I think. Whereas I think in a lot of countries, there's a, there's a demographic that sits about what a birder is in the science. Whereas here, there's, it's a lot broader and that encompasses uh, and one of the reasons I think that's for is because there's a lots of wildlife guides here. Um, and that's one of the routes that a lot of the people take. And you'll see them in the national parks, but also in Kigali, you'll see them on social media. And it's developing that. And so it's that opening and that understanding. But there's also a lot of education about birding. And for example, the great crown cranes you spoke about earlier, it's that education about this is the bird, this is how cool they are. And that education of what's around of nature and how we can actually be at one with nature and live with nature rather than being in conflict, that has come on a lot more here in Rwanda. Um, that's not to say that a lot of the pictures I don't post about some of the birds in Kigali, I get, the, I get questions or, or comments of, I didn't know that bird was here, or thanks for telling me about that bird. I've seen it, but I didn't know the name, so thank you. So it's, that's the area that I'm, I, I guess I, I sit with. And a lot of the writing I do is in newspapers. So in the local newspaper here and also in the regional stuff. And that's around, um, for example, the last article I wrote was about the getting to know Rwanda's birds, the sunbirds. So it looks at the different species we have here in Rwanda, where to find them, talks about their breeding, their nesting, maybe some of the adaptations that have made, made them awesome um, and actually break down some of the myths so they're not closely related to hummingbirds, but they've, evolved separately um, because of the niches they, they wanted and their desire for nectar. And so it's that kind of effort that I talk about. And that's largely because I'm doing the research and the reading and actually and studying about those kind of um, areas that I can then, that I then feel I can have the ability to actually talk about them. Now, Martin's got a, 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 good, a good question here. Uh, do you or have you regretted not having a camera for that for that 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 one bird shot? Yes, no, completely. I do. I take my daughter. So as I, as I've said, Kigali's built on a number of hills, and there's there's big hills all over the place. And my daughter's four, and she's trying to and she's learning to ride a bike right now. So I take her down to the local park, the eco park on a Sunday morning, early in the Sunday morning on a bike. And it's all about her and a bike. But this park has got over a hundred different species of bird in. So you can imagine it's not just the one time or there's a number of times, but that I'll see, for example, beaters or I'll see little uh, white collared olive back finches or a bird that I haven't seen before. And I'll be like, ah, but no. So yes, there is, there's, a num there's not a single, um, single example, but there's multiple examples because of that, uh, unfortunately, but yeah. Um. Now, now, did you hear that, folks? Um, you can go to the local park and there are a hundred species of birds that you might be able to tick off. Now, that's pretty, pretty astounding. Um, so that really leads me into sort of the final themes that I want to get to, Will. If somebody wants to go mm -hmm. 
and join uh, join not necessarily you but to join the the wonderful people of Rwanda and Kigali and go bird watching um how would you suggest someone who maybe has not been to Africa before would would go about it so the first thing i'd say is that Rwanda and Kigali um are not your normal cities or countries within Africa. They're a whole lot safer. They're a lot secure. It is a lot safer and secure compared to a lot of the countries around the continent. Um, to come to Rwanda, you can, as I said, the diversity of the biodiversity here, it's a hotspot and it's, it's a global hotspot and for good reason. It's absolutely stunning. Um, so if you want to go on safari and see the big five, you can do that one day. And because as I said, the country is really quite small. So within, let's say, a week to 10 days, you can be have, spend a couple of days on safari. You can go and trek mountain gorillas on another couple of days, and you can be in a montane forest looking for endemic species of birds for the last three days. It's, and it, the road routes, are, the transport routes are, are great. The roads are great. So to be able to do all of those things, yes, you can, no problem. Um, and I think... Uh, there's a, especially over in Europe, it's a football thing. It's called Visit Rwanda. You'll see them on a number of shirts for Arsenal, Paris Saint-Germain, um, promoting basically their tourism here in Rwanda and, and for good reason. And that's, that's one of the reasons why. Um, yeah. So out, out of a place, it's safe, secure, and you can get all of those things within one country rather than having to travel around to see, for example, safari or gorillas or birds. It's all here. So... Um, well, and Martin, I'll, I'll put, I'll put your comment up shortly. We'll, we'll just get through this. If somebody, um, just wants to travel the way I like, you just arrive in Kigali and then decide what to do based on the weather or where you are, is is it conducive to that, or do you need to have organised a tour or something uh, no, first, or can you just turn up and then? Yep, Kigali. Kigali is a hub of um, all those transport routes, and it, as it as I said, it's not the old capital. It's now right in the middle of the country. So, to to come here, stay in a hotel. There's guide companies all the way around. There's birding birding companies that will take you out and guide you from here. So there's loads of stuff you can actually do from Kigali. So as I said. Around Kigali, there's a number of wetlands and marshes, there's parks and all the rest of it for birding. And actually, it's, it's a good place to um, to start your tour if you're not going to organise anything, because you get to see a number of the birds that you'll see when you go further out, but you want to concentrate on some of the endemic species or some of the more uh, niche birds that you'll see in those environments. So, yes, you can quite happily come to Kigali and organise from there. Yeah. I, I knew this would come up somewhere. Um, now this question is, um, I, I'm sure a lot of people were thinking this when I started promoting that you would be talking to me from Rwanda. Uh, isn't Rwanda a hotspot and volatile? Yep. Now you, you now you said the 28-year 28, 28 history of Rwanda. It's a totally different place now, isn't it? Correct, 100% so. What I would say is it, start as, it sits in direct contrast or stark contrast to a lot of its neighbours, as in this place is Rwanda secure, 100%, as in it's the safest place. And this is why I say if you haven't been to other places in Africa, or, or you have, if you have been, it will feel very different. And if you have been to Rwanda and haven't been anywhere else, then it's a, it's a, it's a stark contrast to difference. Um, yes, it's safe. It's it's secure. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. I, living in Khartoum in Sudan, I used to get stopped by the police for bribes and all sorts of stuff to, to be able to go through um, with pretend violations, traffic violations, and then get told, right, pay me money. Um, I came here and I got stopped the first time in my hire car. Um, and I was like, oh, here we go. And the guy said, can I have a registration plate? You check my number against his system on his phone. No, you haven't got any traffic violations. Go. And I was like, what? It's actually police doing what police are meant to do. Hmm. It's a safe, secure country. And then this is what I mean. It stands out in stark contrast, both the cleanliness, but also the security levels. So 
Is it a volatile hotspot? It sits with its neighbors. So Burundi and the Congo are, yes, definitely volatile hotspots. However, you want safety and security and actually um, a place to be able to go and visit and understand the culture, then yes, Rwanda is here. And I, and I talk about their past because it, to understand the devastation that happened in 1994 and now to see where they are now here and how the country is doing or what it's doing, it's, as I say, it's very impressive and breathtaking. And I don't say that as a Rwandan, I've only been here two years myself, but having traveled quite extensively across the continent of Africa, it, it, it sits apart because of its safety and security. So uh, that's what I, I come back with. And there has been uh, news stories recently about Burundi, uh, and I think some of the the tensions from that existed in Rwanda are now playing out in 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 Burundi. So hopefully, hopefully the whole uh, the whole region can can find some uh, some peace, and hopefully Rwanda will be a model for. Uh, uh, for its neighbours, but you know, but but so many of those countries that have reputations of being um, safe places to go um, have have different issues. I mean, Kenya, Rwanda, uh, not Rwanda, beg your pardon, Kenya, Uganda, uh, Tanzania have all got different things to be aware of. I think it's like travelling anywhere; you yeah. just need to educate yourself, don't you, before you go. Um, Yep, no, completely agree. Um, no, completely agree. Are, well, again, as far as the safety and security, especially in Kigali, you can walk around quite happily at night time on your own in Rwanda and around Kigali streets, and you're safe. Um, so are there, do all countries have issues? Of course they do. Is this safe and secure for a tourist destination? 100% it is. Um, it would be my comeback for that. Uh, Martin, <laughs> um, Martin, I, I, look, I got to say, um, I'm quite a deal older than uh, uh, than you, I reckon, will. But I still, I still love going somewhere. Arriving, I mean, people think I'm mental when I go. You know, I, 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 I I'm, I'm waiting for my for my rabies shot so that when I go to the Philippines again, I go to places that. You know, I'm the first white person that they've seen for years, right? Um, and and there's rabid dogs and all that, mm. but but you don't turn up there and be a dickhead. That's what gets you in trouble. You just go there. You respect where you are, and and people everywhere. I mean, in every country I've ever been in, people people want want to help you and uh, and tell you about their their country their their space their their life you know and there's yeah. places where it's where it's going to be bad as well but you i mean you don't go there that's what travel advisories are for i mean there, no, there exactly. are some there are some risks that are not worth taking um you know correct 100 uh, correct um and, and and this is i kind of guess why having traveled quite extensively um in so uh, having traveled quite extensively across the continent, continent, I'd say the safety and security, for example, being in Nairobi, Dar es Salaam, Cape Town, Johannesburg, it's, this is the, so if that's your understanding of Africa, you come here, you'd be like, hold on a minute. Hmm. It's completely different. And that, that's, that's, I kind of think the point I'm trying to make. So of course yeah. there's issues with all countries and you've got to be careful wherever you go, be that. But I feel safer here in Rwanda than I do walking the streets in the UK. Let's put it that way. Yeah, and 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 that's what pe people forget too. I remember, um, and and we we'll get to your point in a minute, Martin, and also you, Naomi. There's another one there. Um, people people forget the issues from where they where they live. I remember when I was first going to the Philippines, and people that were that I was speaking to before I went there said, "Oh, you got to be really careful." hold your bag really tight and all this. And I'm thinking, mate, I'm, I'm more worried about getting bashed up on, on a Friday night on the train coming back from Frankston, you know, or which I guess for you, Will, might be um, 
having a having a night out in Manchester. I don't know. Um, uh, I think I think Will's on the. Uh, uh, I can still hear your mic, Will. Oh, there we go. You're back. You, you were frozen for a little bit. Um, is, I mean, going out for for a night on the uh, 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 on the uh, on the grog in Manchester might be scarier than um, going out for a. a uh, a night anywhere in in Africa on uh, after a footy match, right? Can you hear us, Will? I can he- I can hear your mic, so you must be there. Uh, I missed your question, Grant, because um, of obviously uh, the awesome internet. Yeah, um, <laughs> I I was just so I was just wondering now, whether it was, um, it was a bit broken. Yeah. Yeah, no, we, we, we had a we had a, a, a drama, but I was just making a, a, a bad joke that a night out in Manchester uh, after a after a footy match might be um, more dangerous than uh, than uh, you know walking home after a night out on the tiles in in Kigali or or even Mombasa. So. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, now, Matt, Martin Martin had a question and. I Martin clarify this if I'm if I'm wrong, but Martin's asked: Are these birds a food source uh, in the general issue? I'm I'm wondering: uh, Are they uh, are birds in Rwanda often bush food? I think that's what Martin is is asking us: Are people eating uh, eating birds? Uh, no, uh, not I think. The majority, no, it's not an issue in regard to population and, and stuff like that. I think the issue is not for fee- eating birds, it's actually, I think, which is a global issue, and that's habitat loss and using, basically using the habitat that should be there for the birds and chopping it down and using it for unsustainable agriculture or stuff like that, or, or why, however they're using them. So birds being munched on, not an issue. Um, the bush trade is actually over in, in neighbouring countries and not here. Um, and there's actually stark laws for that, so no, no, that's not the issue. Okay, and here we go. I'm just coming back to Naomi's question because it's a little bit um, back on back on birds, the conservation status, and uh, and really what not. Interesting question. Um, yeah, predate. Uh, habitat habitat loss, which I think is a global issue for the for the global bird population, is definitely here. And I think the overpopulation. Um, Rwanda is one of the, the I think it's the most densely populated country in Africa, um, and so that does have an impact. But actually, as I say, the the restoration of wetland around Kigali that's then also been pushed out. So they just completed last year one wetland restoration which i was speaking about but now they're looking at another further six so trying to have or trying to fight back against that overpopulation and habitat loss but obviously with the amount of people here therefore the food requirements and therefore habitat loss is still a key issue um are the key ones so overpopulation yes um and that leads to the habitat loss because of what comes in as well now this this question from me, uh, Will, is you may you may not have been there long enough to, to get a, a handle on on this, but with urban development in in Kigali and and there's obviously other urban centres in in Rwanda, uh, do you think they're doing a better job in doing um, environmentally friendly? I know that's a horrible term, but I think. In in a new city, without colonial baggage and and the power structures that come with all, with all of that, are they do, doing a better job of new developments in in an urban setting on the fringes than you're seeing in in say Western countries? Because we're we're completely stuffing it up. We haven't learned a thing in forty years here. Uh, so so uh, I'll get. Yeah, and being so densely populated, I guess that's going to be a big issue. So, it is a big issue. Um, a good friend of mine is actually um, working on what's called the Green City Kigali project, and that's looking at how you do sustainable housing 
that's ecologically friendly. And again, using that buzzword for you, but it's how you do affordable house, uh, how you build affordable housing using actually those kind of ethos and that kind of idea. And so that's in the process of going through now. So have they learned? I, and again, the key thing is for me is looking at the different areas that yes, Kigali, the development is going up and it's continuing to build, but it's an understanding I think where they're coming is actually really kind of good of understanding that normally it's it's flat horizontal building. We're actually realizing you need to build up, but how you do that in an affordable manner and actually the one that doesn't trash the environment. And so that's a work in progress at the moment. So I can't tell you anything about that. But it is going the right way from what I can gather. So if those projects are up and running, it suggests they're learning something. Um, it, yeah, that's probably as far as I go with that. Uh, I did a show recently, Will, about the concept of degrowth and um, thinking about that uh, before and, and, and after that with managing population growth and 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 how western nations are sort of saying well we've got to control the population in africa in asia in south america and and urban development we often have people who will in their day job be campaigning for sustainable development you know affordable housing projects community housing and then at the same time lodging objections with their local council because someone's putting up a six uh, a, a six-story block of flats in a in a neighbourhood where nobody has more than two stories. I mean, people have to understand yeah. that you, you you can't you can't solve the problems everywhere else all the time. And we're yeah we've you know yeah. So anyway, that's just one of my. I, I, uh, I completely my, agree, and I don't think it. I completely agree. I don't think it just sits at housing or that kind of area. I think the West's ability to everything is someone else's fault, right? Everything, yeah. is, but not our own, um, is well, where I'll go for that. Well, we're, we're going through this thing at the moment where we're going to, um, uh, we've got the, the slogan, no more extinctions, yeah, right. Uh, but, but we're going to have this great carbon uh, offset system and it's nearly all based on buying credits in the rest of the world. So, hey, Africa, don't cut down any of your trees. South America, you stop cutting down your trees. We'll keep, we'll keep digging up the... Uh, uh, we'll keep pumping out the oil and sending it to the rest of the world, but we'll offset it in other countries. It's just bullshit. You know, it's total bullshit. And we, yeah. we really need to yeah. just... We've all got to pull our heads in, right, about... How yeah, much no, we agreed. use, agreed. How much we do. So let, let let me tie in secondhand camera gear. Do you ever buy it? Yeah, as I said, uh, my yeah. second camera that I went to, that one DX Mark Three, that was a secondhand camera. I think the secondhand market, especially with the advancements of mirrorless cameras, I think the secondhand market, both with DSLRs and lenses, is one that. It's a great market to jump into. Is my only caveat to that would be make sure you go somewhere or buy someone that you can check the standard of the camera you're getting. So either a shop or a store, or you can check shutter counts, uh, how many shutter counts it's had, and all the rest of it to understand what you're buying if you're going down that market. Mm. It's a great market, but there's a, as with all markets, there's rabbit holes you don't want to be taken down. Um, definitely. Yeah, and and uh, look, I'm I'm still learning, so. Uh, I don't expect that the camera that I just bought is going to be the camera that I'm, uh, you know, falling in love with in two years' time. But in two years' time, yeah. I want to buy something that is, you know, low low shutter count, you know, all, all the things you, you're looking at. But at the moment, I just want it to work and teach me how to, how to take good photos of birds. So, uh, uh, now, nice. Martin... Uh, Martin's got a technical question. Uh, do you find no, auto fine. ISO is a challenge? So I think this is the, the one thing it will depend on is the camera you're using um, and then the standards. So level entry cameras, you'll find more of an issue with auto ISO than you would with the top grade cameras. Um, and that 
syncs over from DSLR across to mirrorless as well. So I think it's less of a challenge with the mirrorless cameras because of the size of the sensors and you can therefore have a higher ISO. But what you can do to, to limit that is have a top and a bottom, uh, well, at least a top level that your camera won't go above. So if you set it to auto ISO, you can put a standard do not go above 6,400. That number will depend on the individual camera. So you need to be happy within certain lights what, how much noise is coming onto that image. So you can put your limit on that. So it can be a challenge, but uh, um, I find it still, I don't, I don't put a limit on my camera and because I want to get the shot and then I'll see afterwards and go, right, actually, I'll look at the back of the camera or the LCD screen and go, yeah, no. Or when you're looking through the viewfinder, you can see it's dotting, dotting, dotting and going high. You know you're not going to get it. And maybe rather than using ISO as the way to get more light in the camera, you might want to, reduce down uh, or open your, your aperture, aperture wider or decrease the shutter speed somewhat to get more light in the camera. So it can be a challenge, but I think it's it's a way, for me, for me anyway, it's the way forward using auto ISO, but it depends on that camera. I'll, I'll just ask Martin or invite Martin too, if you've got a particular issue with, with how you've been using auto ISO or you may be setting it up or something, particularly if it's a, if you're using a Canon, feel free to drop another question in and we'll uh, yeah, see what we can go. Now, we're about to have a look at a question that comes up often, Will. Uh, okay. So, for your opinion, if you were buying on a budget, what would be the things you'd look for and what are the most important things when you're purchasing a camera and that's from mm -hmm. Naomi okay so what do you if you're going to photograph birds um, my two things to be looking for is the focal length of the lens that you're going to get to go with it so with bird photography as a minimum I'd say 300 millimeters as a minimum um, so that's number one uh, number two would be what I'm looking at is the size of the sensor so on a budget the crop sensors DSLRs actually give you a bit of length. What do I mean by that and give you focal length? What do I mean by that? Well, if you're using a full frame camera and you're using a 300 millimeter lens, your uh, focal length is 300 millimeters. However, if you're using a crop sensor, which a lot of the more budget cameras are with a crop sensor, exactly that, then if it's a 1.4 and you're, you have a 1.4 crop sensor that you put on a 300 millimeter lens, it's not 300 millimeters. It's 300 millimeters times 1.4. So you're getting more but more focal length bang for your buck. Does that make sense? So that's let, what let, I'd be looking let, at. Let me, let me explain. Uh, for, for Will to get this 300 mil three, uh, micro four thirds with my professional camera body, I get the equivalent of 600 mil with this lens uh, with with Will's setup. Now, Will, I I did get uh, I I did have a look uh, 600 mil lens. Uh, where are we? Uh, 600 mil lens. Oh, don't tell me. Don't tell me. No, I I haven't got it there. But for those, actually, have I still got the have I still got Sandy in here? Um, I don't think I've still got that photo of Sandy. If you were watching um, watching the Sandy episode, remember that stonking big lens that Sandy was carting around? Uh, I think that was a six hundred mil. Now I get the same from this, yeah. and. And together, they weigh they weigh less. Uh, I think it's one point two kilos. So exactly. But so that's if I want to blow off. it up, if I want to blow it up onto big shots, I don't I don't have as many um, uh, pixels. I don't I don't have the resolution for large. Uh, but no, if no. I'm only ever looking at eight by ten or you know A four size stuff. It's going to be good enough, but is it yeah. going to be good enough for for National Geographic? I don't know. But uh, we have to talk problem, to people. It's also not just, I think it's also not just the focal length you'll get. 
but it's also the quality of that glass, so the quality of the image. Um, and, and therefore, and that's why, as, for, as a photographer, that's why I said my fame, my, most thing I'll be uh, addicted to buying is glass and lenses rather than camera bodies. Um, so if you're buying on a budget, yes, check the shutter. If you're buying secondhand, definitely check the shutter count to make sure someone hasn't gone over it and they're trying to sell you. Um, and with lenses, it's making sure there's no cracks in the glass and you've got to look straight through and there's no elements that are broken within there. Those are the key bits for it. Um, and if it's a telephoto that's smooth, you've got smooth moving and the workings are actually there. Um, and the last thing I'd look at is the rugged seals. If you've got any weatherproof seals around the lens and where it hits actually to the body um, and around where you put in all the DSLR, uh, the, sorry, the SD cards, doing the same thing. That's yeah, those, those that, are the key Actually, that, that, that's the things that you get with experience, isn't it? Because um, the, it, you raised one of the really important things that people often don't think about when they're setting their, uh, when, when they're working within their budget. Hmm. What kind of what kind of photography do you think you're going to be doing? And if you think that you're taking your camera um, camping, and and you like bushwalking, and a bit of drizzle doesn't set you back, well then you must buy something like I've got, which is weather th weather sealed, um, yeah. but this lens isn't. So. Uh, okay. But I do have a smaller lens without the same focal length, length that is. So you just need to yeah, you no need to balance it up. I yeah. want to get a bit. I want to get a bigger lens that's weather sealed. But yeah, um, that's probably going to be another year of saving to uh, exactly to do that. Um, it's, it's also a management of it, not just a management of expectations, not just of the, the equipment you've got, but the level of image as you as you spoke about the level of image or the quality of the image you'll get at the end result. For that budget depending on what your budget is will depend on the outcome yes it takes understanding of how to take the photograph but actually the the quality and the resolution and all those things that come into it will increase with the the more you spend on it so just is a, a management of your own expectations of what you think you'll achieve within that budget that's right if if you don't have an uh, an ultra 4k um monitor for your computer and that's how you're going to look at your photos it doesn't really matter if you've got the sharpest lens in the world because you don't have something that's to to view it to to see those incremental differences between the best lens and the second best or even third best lens. So um, correct, well, yeah. Now this is where everyone geeks out. See, now now we're getting into uh, 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 into geek speak. <clears throat> subject to the camera subject yes com completely right mm. I, I think um and not only that i think with some of the even so for example my 100 to 500 the aperture only goes to 7.1 so i'm when i go and pose or compose a shot i'm looking at the subject the light where it's coming from where it's bouncing off and also the background the distance from my subject to the background but also is that a background that's going to actually um take away from what I'm trying to achieve with the subject. So you no, know, completely with the sensors, yes. Um, you push with the, 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 the depth of the field, of course you do, but there are other elements. Uh, so the aperture is there, number one with it, but also the distance to from you to the camera, uh, you to the subject, subject to the background. No, completely right, Glenn, completely yeah. right. And that, that raises the issue too about really getting to know the equipment that you've got, um, knowing what it can do, what it can't do, what it does best, what it does worst, and then if you mirror, if you if you jam that into your knowledge of the subject and the location, well, then you can get you can get good results using anything. Um, completely. So completely. Yeah, agree. yeah. yeah. Now uh, Naomi has just mentioned yes, uh, she hasn't got a weather sealed <laughs> camera. So yes, um, and look. As long as you work within within those parameters, if you know, if you can protect your camera body and maybe you, your lens is weather sealed, well then uh, you can poke your lens out, but you've still got your your plastic bag around your body. Um, but yeah, exactly that. It, no, completely. Yeah. But uh, yeah. So, folks, last opportunity. If you've got a uh, got a question, um, I want to. I'll take this opportunity to thank Will for 
um, being part of Photography Friday. Um, we've really got into it, uh, Will. Uh, we've really, <laughs> we've really <laughs> taken some time. Uh, just, do you see yourself being a long-term resident now of um, of Rwanda? Is Kigali home? So yeah, one hundred percent, it's home. Um, I think my concept of home might differ from slightly from being in the um, going to a boarding school then being in the army since the age of eighteen. Yeah. My concept of home is where I am, my family is. That's my home. Yeah. So Kigali, one hundred percent, is my home. Been here two years so far, and I'll be here for another two years at least. After that, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, okay. So um, um, yeah, I can I agree with Ben. Yeah, let's let's pop that up again here. I I put uh, uh, get to know your equipment. Oh yeah, Glenn, I that one nearly slipped past. Yes, uh, that yeah the the the, the oh, disposable you. shower caps. Yeah, fantastic. And always always have a couple of um, uh, rubber bands of different types uh, in your in your cat in your kit. I would say too. Um, Naomi's saying yes. thank you. Uh, that's great. Um, are you on Instagram? Yes, I'm on. I am. Yeah, two W's photography. Ah, yes. Okay, I will obviously link to all of that. Uh, another uh, another recommendation uh, that you're being asked for, Martin. I, I, uh, will from you. Martin. I yeah. guess there's. I guess there's a, a a caveat to this one, Martin. What what camera system are you in already? Because uh, I'm I'm assuming that Will will probably say if you're in one system and you already have invested in it, probably best to stay in it. But uh, let's see. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I would say uh, recommend a camera setup. I as I said during this i'm i'm canon i've been canon i'll stay with canon because uh, it does everything i want to um and so if you're photographing birds as i say a minimum of 300 millimeters if you can get more great um and i at the moment my workhorse is an r3 and a 100 to 500 and i like i know we, I, I spoke about a lot about the prime lenses but i like the, the diversity or the, the flexibility it gives me with a telephoto lens that I can actually change subjects and, and reframe them. And especially with birds, with trying to get close enough to be able to fill that frame, to be able to move that telephoto ring to allow me to get more focal length is the best way to do it rather than actually, yes, I can, I'm a big believer in moving around to get the right um, background and the right uh, composition that you're after. But actually, if it means getting too close to the bird, I'd rather have a telephoto lens that allows me to do it um, rather than that large prime. And so think about flexibility. So I go, as I said, my Canon R3 and the RF 100 to 500 is my workhorse. It's light, it's flexible, and it gives me so many opportunities and options. Um, the downsides, as, as there is with all, is that wide open aperture at f7.1. If I could just make it a little bit wider, then I'd be even happier, but you, you, you've got to live with what you've got, right? Um, so they, those are what I'd be suggesting. Absolutely. So Martin's uh, Martin's that, got that a, works. a yep. Um, now, do do you also have a you know maybe a, a a fifty mil prime that you that you take out with you all the time? Uh, so with? I did, and I've gone away again. I've gone away from my fifty mil prime. I've now got a twenty four to seventy zoom. Um, so that covers, okay. and that's, and that's what, with my three lenses, or even those two lenses, I've got from 24 millimeters through to 500 millimeters covered with those two lenses. And then I've got a 600 for the longer stuff as well on that as well. Um, the, what, the one thing we haven't spoken about is actually looking at some lenses rather than uh, having to get a longer, huge lens, it's actually looking at the extenders. And, and those, I, and again, I was just going to ask you about speed boosters and extenders. So. so extenders, I would say it depends on what you're going to use them for. If if the shot is way out of your focal length and you think by putting an extender on, it's going to make the pin drop into a posted side stamp, then potentially don't use it and change your position. But if it's there and you've got a nice 
you've got a nice frame, but actually you want a bit more detail, then an extender is a great way to go. But, and, and the one thing I haven't said is the, when you're shooting handheld, is bearing in mind that your shutter speed, if you're using a 600 millimeter focal length on your camera, on your lens, sorry, then your shutter speed should not go below 600 millimeters. So whatever your shutter speed shouldn't go below your focal length. And that's without incorporating image in stabilization that comes with a lot of the newer cameras nowadays. But if you have that as your rule of thumb, then you're not gonna go far wrong um, with how long. But don't forget, if you put in the times two extender on, that's down to 1200. So that's one 200th of a second you're having to get up to, uh, one 1200th of a second you're having to keep as your minimum. So just bear those things in mind as well. Um, extenders versus speed booster? Because they're not they're not the same thing. Have you got a? Uh, do you have Do you have both? Um, I used to use extenders, and now I've stopped because I actually with five hundred millimeters. If I've not got the frame or the composition I want, I'll move my position. Um, is where I go for just because I think. And again, you spoke about sharpness and actually the definition and the resolution. You lose some of that, and it gets a bit cloudy with extenders a lot of the time. That being said, if you put an extender with a mirrorless body with a technology, some of the technology in mirrorless now, you get some really good results. So whilst I don't do them, I know a lot of friends that do use them and get great results from them. So, and speed boosters, yeah, I, I just don't, I haven't gone towards them to be fair. Um, whether, I'm not saying they're a bad idea, I'm just saying I don't use them. So um, I don't comment. <laughs> um. Now Shane, Shane's a new uh, a new member of the Riot Squad. Um, oh, thanks to Shane, by the way. Um, I don't think I've sent you uh, an email, but uh, thanks very much. Shane went to thebirdemergency dot com uh, slash join. Uh, you can also go to thebirdemergency dot com slash coffee. Um, so there we are, Shane. Thank you. Um, now an an RX RX ten. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. Do you know? Do you know that one? No, I don't know that one. But as a bridge camera, um, that again, you've got the. It's because it's the non DSLR, so you've got the stuff coming out. Yeah. That bridge between that compact. But no, I've never heard of that model. But if it gives you 600 mil and equivalent lens and and travelling, where where weight is a key requisite, then you've got a lot of bang for your buck right there. I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Sony, Sony at the moment, um, got some great things, uh, coming out. I mean, that was, that was my, my decision, whether I went with the, um, uh, micro four thirds or, or, or Sony. And it was really only the, uh, the weight of the glass, which, um, uh, which, which made me go the way I did. Plus I can, you know, Pretty good camera, secondhand the uh, the uh, the Lumix stuff. So um, yeah, no, completely agree. But yeah. but you're locked into a, a, a an ecosystem for sure. Um, Correct. But yeah, yeah, we'll just go with that. Uh, okay, last chance, folks. Uh, before we let uh, let Will go, I, I I want to ask Will whether he's whether he's had a photography disaster, especially if you were. Like, if you were commissioned, uh, or or you were you were out on a shoot to, you know, deliver deliver something, client work or a magazine story or something, uh, have you had a disaster? So, uh, luckily, well, it's kind of a disaster. So I um, did some work with an organisation called Gorilla Doctors, and these guys are the the wildlife vets that go up into the national park and look after the mountain gorillas in the volcanoes up in the north of the country. Um, and so uh, they asked me to get some, go out with them and get some shots of them doing their work. Um, and so I, I, I'd been to see gorillas, I'd, I'd tracked gorillas before. And so it was my first time. And I was like, right, okay. In my head, I was like, they need shots of the vets doing their work. And so that for an observation, they're using telephoto lens because they can't get close to the actual gorilla to do an observation and checks. And that's how they do the health checks. And so I was getting photos and he's writing notes and the vets are writing the notes. So I'm taking photos of this. And in my head, I'm consciously going, don't get any shots. It's not, you're not there for the gorillas. You're there for the vets, not there for the gorillas. So my shots are posed with vets 
and like a, a gorilla, but that's about it. And so they don't dominate the image. I get back and the, um, the comms lady's like, have you got any pictures of the gorillas? I was like, um, <laughs> I've got to get photos of the vet. <laughs> so luckily we went out the, the week after and I've been, I, and I was like, right, okay, a few shots of the vets, now all about the gorillas. So yeah, that was, that was my misreading of the, so if you take commissioned work, make sure you get your requirements down. That's probably the key one. Yeah, well, they they probably didn't communicate clearly to you what the end right. use of the of the images were, because if, exactly. if 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 you knew that it was being used for PR PR photos, you know they they wanted some work, they wanted some photos to help them do their work, but they also wanted some nice pictures to help them raise some money for their exactly. service, no doubt. Um, exactly. So yeah, what exactly. uh, that was probably the worst. Yeah. Uh, now, Martin, Martin's thinking of getting a modern day camcorder. I reckon you can get some really great, um, you know, four K camcorders that are even up to five, six years old now that you can pick up for a song. Um, so, yeah. what I'd also say is the the ability for video in now in the DSLRs and and some of the cameras actually you can get rather than getting two different things. Then I have the one in the same camera. So not a, good, a lot of the camera bodies, you can get really good video. So maybe even think about rather than the camcorder and the, and the camera, you just getting combined and getting a good camera that does that, well, that video you're that, after. That's pretty much what I bought. I because I've got the the show um, and I want videos. I bought the Panasonic, which is a it's a hybrid, but it's a video camera that takes great stills it's not a still camera that takes good video so um you just nice. make what what's your use that's, case that's i mean that's really that's the right. question um yeah yeah um I, I i can't see myself ever trawling through thousands of still images um that i've taken <laughs> uh i'd i'd I just don't think that's where my interest is, but maybe th little three, four, five minute videos and lots of talking head stuff, um, you know, on location. That made yeah. my that that made my choice. So, I think. D do you spend a lot of time thinking about how you're going to use the camera before you buy it? Will like, did, um, or or or. or do you get sucked into because you know you, you did say that you would you would suffer from from gear acquisition syndrome uh, if you had a had a shop nearby? Do you sometimes think oh, um, that you, you you buy you buy the equipment and then go how am I going to use it because it's got oh, all these great things, or do you think no, no I need something that does this job? I all think somebody that does this job. So for me, it's definitely stills are the primary and then video is secondary. Um, and therefore, yeah, I buy for that. So sensor size, uh, frame per second rate, all the rest of it comes with that rather than looking at the video stuff. So I buy to fill the need of what I'm, I'm trying to do rather than go, that's shiny, I'll buy that. Now, what do I do with it? <laughs> so no, I don't go down that route. No. <laughs> um, there's somebody that I, I follow on YouTube uh who who always uh, well he he, he says he doesn't get all these given to him he says he goes and buys those he's got a new body every every month um he's either taking a huge loss every time he sells uh, sells one of those or he's getting given it to him but god or or he's got more mo more money than uh, than Elon Musk Right, I mean, who? Yeah, it's not cheap. But who, no, it's who, not who, cheap. Who, who can buy? Who can buy four, uh, four new top of the range camera bodies in a year? I mean, we're talking. I mean, that's that, that's a housing that's a deposit in in, in yeah. the centre of Melbourne, right? I mean, that's just, yeah. uh, crazy. Now, mm -hmm. oh, Naomi, Naomi's, Naomi's told me that I'm going to get hooked on. Looking at stills. Oh, jeez, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, I'm with Naomi. I go through lots of stills, lots of stills yeah. run. Um, I, but. I would probably have to purchase two new computers if, if I was able to keep up with 
audio processing, video processing, and then and then just sorting through uh, yeah. stuff. It's well, hard enough. Hard yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> I've got plenty. I've got plenty of hard drives, but but you need the processing power if you're trying to do all of these things in well, in the amount of time yeah. we've got. Um, uh, yeah. All right. Let, let let let's just do the last. The last thing now that Naomi's talked about going through uh, thousands of stills, what do you use for your um, post post production Light. stuff? Yeah, I'm all Lightroom. Lightroom? So I, I, yep, Lightroom, one hundred percent. And I think as a as a software program that's come on leaps and bounds recently um, with a whole load of different add ons. I like uh, Photoshop because it's I think we spoke last time or previously about how um, I don't like edited, hugely edited, or photos that mix things around. So Photoshop really wasn't my thing. Um, and Lightroom gives me everything I want. So be that saturation, vibrance, or anything you want to add to it as far as that, those elements. And actually, it works quite well from moving across. I also then use Topaz Labs, um, are a really good software program. So I use Denoise and Sharpen. Um, and your issue with getting resolution, there's a great little program called Gigapixel, which you can put the yeah. back in, which I think is just amazing. It blow my mind. Um, so those, I, and I only use Gig or Topaz lab software as and when. So if I'm shooting in forest areas where the ISO is huge, then yes, I'll put it through denoise. Um, mm. So those, those, that's kind of the workflow that I use, but that's it. And, and if you don't know Topaz, um ai it's ai yeah, baby correct. so um, yeah. which no, which is completely. which is just a buzzword uh, for saying it's a very very complex set of al algorithms uh exactly. it's not thinking it's not thinking <laughs> uh so yeah to topaz does some pretty amazing stuff um uh the latest iteration to people if you want something that's sort of um, more open source. The latest DaVinci Resolve is is amazing too. Okay. Um, no. Yeah. So and it, it it coupled with um, uh, with Topaz. Uh, oh, right. Wild, okay. wild. Oh, nice. Where uh, iOS, Mac, or are you a Windows? Uh, I'm Mac. Windows too. I'm Mac. Mac. I went with Apple iPhone first of all, and I've stayed with them um, through my time. Uh, but yeah, a MacBook Pro is what I use. Uh, now here we go. This is uh, there we there we go. This is a good a good question. Now, uh, I'm, I'm, now I'm thinking, will that because you know your your camera well and you know your glass, you know how it performs in different mm -hmm. setups. I'm thinking you probably get pretty good shots out of the camera anyway, and that the post pros the post processing is mm -hmm. really just cherry on top stuff, isn't it? Like yeah, uh, no, correct. Like garbage no, in, garbage out. It, it yeah, is it all, is always is always the rule, isn't it? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that getting great out of great shot off straight off the camera is exactly where you should be, and that's where you should be aiming. Um, your point of rubbish in, rubbish out is complete. As far as I can see, is completely there. You're not going to get a sharp image composed nicely um, and do anything like that in your processing if you haven't actually done the right stuff in camera first. Um, no, completely, you need to know yeah. your camera to get it, and you should be. Yeah, um, Topaz is re Topaz is really good, but it still won't polish a turd. Right, so <laughs> it'll put glitter um, on it. <laughs> no, <laughs> that, that's right, that's right. It'll it'll put some hundreds and thousands on, or yeah. or, or, or or as I said the other day, I can't remember what it was about. You know, w would you like Vegemite with your shit sandwich? You know, it's like, yeah, that's you know. what you're munching. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, uh, yeah. Um, now I did see uh, Glenn. Are you still are you still with us, Glenn? Um, Glenn takes photos of birds but also plants so it's a question i usually ask people now we haven't talked about it and you didn't really mention it with any of your gear mm -hmm. do you do any macro um i used to 
And, and that, I think before I came to Rwanda, I used to do quite a chunk, but I've moved away from it just because I'm completely focused on wildlife and birds, to be fair. And so whilst macro does obviously come within that niche, I haven't, as I said, I got rid of all those, my lenses, DSLR lens, and they've just literally got those three um, mirrorless lenses. So I, I don't do, I did do, um, and I used to do stacking and all sorts of stuff. I used to love macro stuff, but I just moved away from it. Um, I, I like the process with macro. I like the whole process with stacking. I like the whole um, composition of framing. And there's a guy on Twitter who's actually, I follow Nick on Tom, his name is, who's mm. a really good account. who does some really amazing macro stuff. Um, and, and to be fair, as I said, I think <laughs> what my professor said, he said, when you find your thing, what you touch will turn to gold. And so macro, I enjoyed it, but I don't think it turned to gold when I, when I created images. So um, that's why. I three fungi flora. That's cool. And again, it's your passion, and that, that's the right thing to do. Is to photo, as long as you're photographing your passion, and that's for for Glens of three Fs. That's that's awesome. Um, I think I've I've gone. I was really quite wide, and I've, I've my my photo set has niched down quite a lot. And I think what was lovely is I don't. I'm now not not worried about saying. So I used to do event stuff. I used to do all sorts of stuff, and now I. I go, has it got people in it? Yeah, well, I'm not doing it. I prefer to take photos of animals, nature. If you've got people in it, no, I'm, I'm good, thanks. Except your daughter, right? Well, yeah, except my daughter, family, <laughs> um, and documentary stuff. But it's not, it's the, it's the frame portrait stuff that I just, yeah, or weddings and things like that. It's like, ouch, no, stay away. <laughs> Actually, this is, uh, I was going to say last question. It's not a second last question unless someone from the gallery uh, comes in with another one. How much better are your family photos now than they were five years ago? A whole lot better, a whole lot better. Composition, framing and perspective. It's one of the things, especially when I'm doing workshops, is um, people... It's explaining, get back in the same eye level of the subject you're taking. So if you go through a lot of even uh, family friends I've got and, and you look at their the pictures they've taken of their kid and they're stood upright looking down at the kid at the top of the head and the kid looking up, <laughs> get down on the same level and you're just going to get amazingly better for photos. And that's yeah. and that and understanding the rule of thirds and where to put horizon, horizon lines and actually co compose your images properly. Yeah, they've come on leaps and bounds. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I, I do like Glenn's comment. Yet, yeah, don't photograph anything that talks back to you. I, I think that's that's, that's nice. I like that. that. I'm a big that, fan of it. <laughs> fair enough, uh, Martin. Uh, yeah, I think I think that's I think that's right. Um, yeah. I, that's why I'm the great imposter here. I don't. I used to love taking photos, but 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 I stopped. So I'm obviously not a photographer. I'm someone who uses photography to do other things. Um, but I, I'm really into the process. Are you, uh, are you just addicted, Will? I guess that's a good way to. Yeah, yeah. I'm completely addicted to photography. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I agree with you. It's a process. I love that process. I'm. I like the process and I like the results you get from it. But then. As I say, with the birding and what's got me over the last two years is the understanding behavior and learning different mm -hmm. behaviors, habitat, environment, displays, courtship, nest building, how they find mates. So th this for me is the bit that makes it amazing. And so it's mm -hmm. by having that passion, it takes your, I think it takes your photography to another level because you're wanting to try and understand how to get that one shot. Um, and it's, yeah. I, it was an American, I've written a quote down that I wanted to say, because I think it links really well, that humans are a part of nature, not apart from nature. So I, yeah. I, and I love that. I think it's so conclusively in. I, I just think, yeah, well, that's what we are. But it's understanding the other people and the other creatures that we share this world with um, and just getting to understand a little bit of their behavior. Yeah, it gets me excited. I, I get goosebumps just talking about it. That's, <laughs> so, that's <cool>. yeah. <laughs> now, hold your book up again. So let's let 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 let's get that in again. There we go. Falling for the birds of Kigali. Now, everyone, 
when when I get all this organised tomorrow, we'll um, uh, we'll get um, the links to that and uh, and get. Oh, Naomi's addicted too. Here we go. Uh, Naomi can't go a day without taking a shot. Yeah, yes, and I'm with you. I'm yeah, with you. and and this, this is the thing for me. It's about learning the 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 photographs help me understand the birds and that's what what i'm into i'm glad i know naomi is naomi's um you know naomi's into birds you know she's a bird nerd so awesome it's good um i asked you this when we were dropping in and out um so you probably didn't hear it do you get invited to speak to schools and and other groups about photography and or Birds and wildlife in general. So, since the books come out, yes, I've been. I start, it started at my daughter's little preschool, and then other people have seen it, and then asked for me to go and talk. And I'm like, yeah, no, completely. If I can, if I can open the eyes to anyone about what's on their doorstep with regards to the bird life, and explain a little bits about birds, it's it's not just showing a book. It's explaining, I don't know, for example, the, the conversation we had about the hammercock, or understanding the, the, the point about swifts and swallows and how long a swift stays in, in the air for and the fact it mates in the air, it can sleep in the air. And it's all these little nuggets of facts that blow blow kids' minds and they're like, what, really? And that, that eye-opening experience that you see when you talk to kids is, yeah, it's pretty awesome. So, yeah, yeah I do, yeah. Fantastic. Well, Will, um, thanks. I can't believe I can't believe how long we've been we've been chatting for, <laughs> uh, and and we we could just keep going. That's the the amazing thing about birds and photography. You really there's really always cool. another question about gear or technique or something. Um, well, I hope I hope that you'll 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 join the family and that sometime down the line. What I usually do with Photography Friday, but I. My usually co, one of my co contributors is off on a uh, on a trip, so I usually try and get a an experienced photographer in with someone at a lower level, and then and then the full. Um, so I'll, I'll 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 invite you back again, and hopefully we can find a find a time where you know maybe maybe you can let me know um, you know shoot me through some people that you'd love to talk to, you know, maybe some yeah. of the people that you stalk on, on YouTube and we'll see if we can get, uh, uh, get them together. I'm, I, I've got a couple of, uh, African people that have, I've seen their safari, uh, photography that I would love to talk to. Um, cool. and especially to talk ethics as well with, uh, with, yes. with a bunch of them. Yeah. Um, Martin's got, how can you, that, that's a great way to finish off. I just love birds. Yeah. Freedom. That's right. Uh, birds are cool. Um, now I think the only thing I want to tell you all about again, I do want to run the, uh, run the ad again. Um, oh, look. I'm going. I'm going to pop this one up just to get your comment because we were talking about Sandy we again. Yes, that's Sunny that's a, that is a fantastic picture for Australia. No doubt about it. No Sunny. doubt about it. Um, so the only other thing I want to do there is just re remember you all um, that you can you can help me out with streaming and hosting and all those kind of costs. And um, and by going to birdemergency dot com slash join, if you want to be a member and get on the members only streams, or the birdemergency dot com slash coffee, if you want to, um, you know, just tip something in the bucket, which really helps. I'll tell you what's coming up next week. Busy, busy, busy week. Monday, it's a public holiday here, but. <coughs> Holly's not not on with me, but we're we're talking low carbon birding because you know I'm all into that and urban birds on a Monday. Wally Hampton, who used to be an 
a podcaster about birds, but he does his birding in the city on a skateboard. So, awesome. so he's a, he's a skater birder. Um, Tuesday, Bruce Robertson. Uh, sorry, Bruce Richardson. I knew I'd do that. Uh, who has done a big year around Australia, but that's turned into a couple of books. So that's Tuesday. That's 9.30 in the morning, by the way. Wednesday night, 1 o'clock, Dawn Chorus episode. So nice. if you want to contribute to the Dawn Chorus, email me. Got to be a video file, please. You don't have to be in it. Just do it like I do my first scene and heard. Um, so that's Dawn Chorus at thebirdemergency.com. That's 1 o'clock Wednesday. And then Thursday, we're going to talk migratory birds. Um, Rebecca Heisman has a, bird, has a book coming out about migratory birds. She's in North America. That's at 8, 8 a.m. on Thursday. And somewhere in amongst that, Millie's coming back to talk to us about. Millie Formby, have you seen Wing Threads, Will? The, Mi, Mi, Millie's been flying a microlight aircraft around Australia, which is about, it approximates the distance that the shorebirds uh, fly from southern Australia or, or west, the western coast up mm -hmm. to uh, Russia, the Arctic Circle. So she's flying around, but popping in at schools and community groups and, and oh, whatnot. Awesome. And we spoke to Millie before she went, and she was pushing her crowdfunding. She made her target and is about two-thirds of the way around. Wow. But she, but she wants to do a bit more, and she's got another crowdfunding coming up. So, um, yeah, that's it. And there's more still coming, but that's everything that's booked in right at the moment. So a big week of bird emergency next week. Um, and Martin saying, beautiful. Thanks, Martin. I... I, I I, I I did the number one blade today. Thanks very much. Um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, so yeah, Will. I I'd, I'd love to have I'd love to have you back, and maybe you could um you you can be the be the expert when we talk to someone else, or maybe you can say your bucket list photo buddy that you'd love to talk to, and we'll yeah. we'll get them on and put them through their best photos. And uh, okay, yeah, no, I'd love to. actually okay. actually. Would you say they were your best photos, or are they just your favourite photos? Well, like that, that favourites, favourites, favourites. Yeah, I don't, I don't know which my best ones to be fair, but favourites definitely. It, it, is there such a thing? Like, can you pick out of your it's probably hundreds of thousands of photos your best one? Because I there's no such can. thing, is there? Yeah, no. is there such a thing? You'd have to say no. your best photo at night, your best photo in the desert, your best photo in the Antarctic, your best photo in the jungle. Exactly. I mean, yeah, yeah, no, that's I how, Yeah, that's how I'd look at it. <laughs> great. Thanks, everyone. Uh, it's always great to get the Riot Squad uh, getting in on the action, and we'll see you all soon. This has been Photography Friday, the bird emergency. Will Wilson, who is in Rwanda? Yes, to answer that question. Um, oh, look, there's always one who comes in. Uh, yeah. Martin, are you telling me that I need to start putting my own photos in the show? Is that what you mean? Uh, I, I, I think it is. Clarify that. Um, would you like to know why there are no photos of mine yet? Would you like to know? You want to hear the story? It's because I'm still saving up for the bloody special Perfect. SD cards. Um, so... I've got one. I need one more, and then I'm all set up. I've got the. Uh, um, I think. I think Naomi is saying yes. She wants to know. So, I did hope that I would be volunteering my shots. I've nearly learnt the camera, but I haven't got the SD cards in, and I can't save them properly. Anyway, hopefully by the next Photography Friday, that has been eradicated. But I am having a lot of fun getting. The magpies. I do a thing called Photography Friday. Uh, not, of course I do that. That's here. I do first seen and heard each morning, Will. I go out and on all the socials, I just yeah. say the first yeah. bird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First bird I saw, first bird I heard. And I'm habituating the local birds to 
uh, to the lens and the camera and me waving it around and sitting around because they're used to this. So, yeah, I just do do that. Um, okay, good. Well, also, Will, I'd like to invite you, I should have said, um, can you can you use your iPhone outside one morning and just do a, like I do with the photography, fr- uh, with the photography, fr- first seen and heard, get, a, get us a Kigali Dawn Chorus. Just do yeah, a little, because we... We'd love okay. to talk about that. Um, we got we got piles of submissions last time, so we're what okay. middle of next week. Middle of next week, we're doing the next one. One a month, we do the dawn chorus, so we can track what changes over the over the year through the seasons. Um, here we go. We've got one more. Yeah, always depends what you want to shoot. That's right. I think that's in relation to best picture. I mean, every day is a different day too. Um, you know, sometimes you can. Do you... Actually, sorry, Correct. sorry, Will. I, I, I can't, I can't help with this. Do you take different types of photos depending on your mood? Like when, when you're out, like especially if you're working and you need to take, for instance, the vets with the gorilla. But if you're in a grumpy mood, do you take different photos than if you're in a really good mm. mood, or, or you've just had an amazing bowl of pasta or something like? <laughs> um, yeah, I probably do actually. I think darker, or as in, not necessarily the images I take, but maybe how I process them, or the speed of darker and, and stuff like that, depending on my mood. Edgier photos, more shadow, and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I, mean, I never actually thought about that. That's really interesting. I'm gonna, I'll come back to you with a proper answer next time we talk. But yeah, I'll think about that. I've never actually thought about well, that. that. Huh. So isn't it good? Isn't it good being uh, interviewed by someone who has got no clue? <laughs> and I can ask you all all sorts of really no clue. Uh, no, um, yeah. Now, now the, the the riot squad will appreciate this question. Will um, urban birds in Kigali? You know, you've been mm-hmm. in Khartoum. You've been all around. Uh, well, I'm guessing you had numerous postings. Uh, in in the military, so you've seen lots of lots of cities, no doubt, lots of cities around uh, around the UK as well. Mm-hmm. Um, what are the really common average urban birds that you that you see all the time in Kigali? And do you have the 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 usual suspects? Have you got the house sparrow, the tree sparrow, the starling? Have you got a miner like we've got the Indian miner or the common miner? Have you got any no rubbish way. birds? That and of yeah. course, all rubbish birds are great birds as well. But have you got any rubbish birds? So we've got the sparrows. The sparrow families are like the the typical the typical urban birds, and some of the little finches as well. Um, so those guys. But I think it's the house sparrow that I think is pretty awesome. It's it's yeah. managed to. To, to get everywhere and it's managed to get from what I can gather speaking of a Rwandan friend of mine naturalist uh, he said that basically they've only recently managed to get to Rwanda and that's actually on using the same routes from Dar es Salaam in Tanzania on the routes in from there and the trucks and all the, all that kind of stuff and the routes so they've only just turned up um, but for me it's the little finches so the fire finches for me here they're really quite common um, in Kigali and and across Africa to be fair but they're just so bright, so and speckled and awesome. So that that's probably my favourite one. Um, but as I say, hats off to the house sparrow for being able to do what it can. <laughs> and and do you, did they? I mean, you lot, right? You, you lot, when you came here in your tall ships, bought the blackbird and the. Uh, well, we've got the song thrush, but it never really established. I wouldn't have minded that, but. Uh, we got the common miner. We got the the house sparrows and and tree sparrows and green finch and the goldfinch. Uh, yeah. ha, have you got the have you got the starling there? Um, the common the blackbird. Loon. Common blackbird. I no, not common blackbird. But we do have starlings. We've got the starlings here. Are, um, the rupal long tail starling. Oh, um, oh, but they but they're proper starlings. They're African starlings. I mean, yeah, we I mean, haven't you, got any of the, the You haven't got starlings. you haven't got any of the rubbish starlings. I mean, no, they've, they've stayed away. Okay. 
well, no, uh, uh, no one bought them there. Uh, they, we, we, exactly. we, we, we had a, we had a society here in the uh, early eighteen hundreds. I can't remember exactly what it was called, um, but you know they bought the rabbit and the hare and the fox, and because of course you want everything to look like Cornwall or Kent. Um, <laughs> so thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thank, uh, yeah, thanks. All. Yeah, it did us. It really did us a solid there. Um, where, actually, where, where's home in, in in the UK? Like, we we have folks are, just are from of, where you... just north of uh, London, a place uh, a county called Hertfordshire. Uh, oh, Hart, Hertfordshire. Um, yeah. Um, they've got a they got a really good women's netball team. I remember. Um, okay, good. Yeah, I didn't I know that, to, but awesome. uh, right. you, you, you used to have a friend who 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 played for them professionally when they when they started. Okay. So what what's the rubbish birds in Hertfordshire? Uh, the magpies, as I think, are the common ones. Um, sparrows, obviously, the sparrows. Um, I like the tits. I'm a big fan of the blue tits, the great tits. They're all the little tap mice. So they're just lovely. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't put them in the little brown bird box, but yeah, they're, they're a common sight around the place. And then obviously the pigeons and the gulls, um, which I, I, it's the word of the, the idea of using the word pigeon compared to using the word dove. Mm. And in it, they explain when you go dove, oh, that's beautiful. It's lovely. When you go pigeon, oh, uh, that's just bang. A, it's a rat with wings and you can't have that. I'm like, what? No, but, come on. I but, understand it. But they but they're talking about the like the rock dove or the the feral pigeon rather than your wood pigeon. Your wood pigeon is is amazing in the UK. Yeah, the emerald uh, and the blue, they're beautiful. Yeah, yeah, and the African one, which is a nice, lovely, bright green. Yeah, yeah that's pretty cool. And of course, uh, of course, when we're wrapping up, we get another good a good question. Uh, what's the the fastest, most unpredictable? I'm guessing bird you have photographed. Um. The, 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 most of, probably some of the swallows. So uh, there's a we get a, a type of swallow called the white-headed sawwing, which is fast, erratic, and all over the place, and doesn't seem to. Yeah, it's erratic, and so that, those guys are probably the hardest ones. Um, yeah, the swallows and the, the swifts are more. Uh, swifts are like it. It's those sort of fast-moving birds that are catching on the wing, that you're trying to get in flight. Those kind of flight shots, um, and they just take time. And this is why I'm more than happy with a nice big SD card because it'll take a few times for you to get the shot that you're after with that composition. Mm. Um, so swallows and swifts are probably the, the hard ones to get, um, I'd say. And Martin had another question where I, I, I think Martin's asking, do you, uh, do you target uh, something when, you, when you're going out or do you just, you just out, on a, uh, out on a leisurely stroll and just shoot whatever pops into view so i think for this book because it was it's not as a guidebook as such it's more photographs of those birds so you i could be less focused on i need to tick this this species off and that was more and it was really nice and chilled and relaxed the, the next books i'm working on are more bird behavior and so that's going to be a lot more focused and targeted so yeah at the moment Very quite easy and nice and open but after that it's it goes even further because it's not just a species, but it's the right time of the year to be doing that that behaviour that I'm trying to photograph. So we'll so see. How long do you think your second book is going to take to to see the light of day? So I'm hoping by the end of the year. So oh, well, it's good. So wife, you, you, yeah, yeah. yeah. With oh. my wife, it can be a lot of the typing, and then when she yeah. comes back, I can then head off into the bush and get start photographing what I need to. Um, but it's, I'm working quite closely with a lot of the, the local guides, especially at the, the national park I was speaking on the west of the country called Nyungwe, which is this uh, montane forest and it's got all the endemic species. But it's working with a guide who's worked there for 20 years. His, his knowledge of birdsong and sound and being able to identify is just unbelievable. So I'm trying to coordinate with him to understand which either migrants or endemics are breeding at what time and all the rest of it to get, uh, for example, one of the images I'm looking for are the trogons. Um, and so when they do their courtship display, it's more, it is, it's like a lek. So like a communal courtship display, all the blokes come together, but rather than being on the ground, it's an aerial lek. 
So the females will be below on a perch and the males will be up in the air flying around and displaying for the females to then decide. So I have a number of these shots that I've got in my head that I need to capture that are quite specific and unique. So when I say the end of the year, it depends on when those shots come through yeah, and I get the right yeah, season. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> we will now, see, but yeah. Yeah, and now now the the next 20 trips that you do out, you won't see any. Um, no, of course not. That's, that's course always not. the way it goes. Um, <laughs> now, I'm, I'm sure everyone will want me to make sure that I get you to put me uh, put me in touch with these tour guides because I'm sure that I'm sure that we we do tour guide Thursday when I can line up people to talk about really tours and of course makes sense that we would do Rwanda yeah. I think now doesn't it so yeah no problem uh, at all. yeah Got yeah and and, and 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 I'd love to talk to your friend uh, with the uh, sanctuary for the. Grey Crown Cranes as well. I think yeah, that sounds like a cool. terrific project. So that fits right into <laughs> right into the bird emergency. All right, now we're really done. Unless anyone uh, unless anyone puts something in right now that is stunningly smart and interesting. Well, thanks so much. Um, best wishes, best wishes for the family, uh, your your wife especially. Uh, and I look, I look forward to talking with you again. This has been Definitely. a lot of fun, boy. Oh, boy, Riot Squad. Um, what have we got? We've we've had we're coming up to six hours of bird emergency content today. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Will. See you, everyone. Don't forget birdemergency dot com slash join the birdemergency dot com slash coffee, and all the links for Will will be down below, especially. What a great Christmas present the the bird book would be, hey? I reckon. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no worries, mate. See you, everyone. <laughs>